our next vacation. So how can you find the best spring travel deals? Spring is in the air, and after years of missing out, college students and families are making spring break a priority this season, with hotspots in Florida, the Southwest, and south of the border at the top of the list, according to travel booking site Hopper. If you're headed to a very popular warm weather spring break destination, you should be booking your flight now. Travel costs are not immune to inflation. Hotel rates are up 64% from last year, and flights cost 20% more. But there are spring break deals out there. Hopper advertising $82 round trip flights to Orlando from New York, Boston to San Diego for $190, and Newark round trip to Turks and Caicos for $260. But the clock is ticking. Families heading to vacation hotspots should book as soon as possible. Prices might rise by more than $200 a ticket in the weeks closer to spring break. Expect full flights and hotels and make contingency plans in case of flight cancellations. For budget-conscious travelers, be flexible. Midweek flights can be up to $100 cheaper per person. Wait to book big city hotels. Last-minute room deals can save you up to 25%. And consider a staycation. One of the best ways to get an incredible deal when you do a staycation is to reach out to local hotels or accommodation providers. Ask if they have a geofenced rate. Hotels often will offer a lower rate to residents of the town, the community, sometimes even the state, to incentivize locals to stay at their accommodations. Meanwhile, international travel has also roared back with Asian destinations like China, Japan and Indonesia reopening post pandemic and attracting crowds of young people eager to experience a new part of the world and take advantage of the strong dollar. When you add up hotel, eating out, Ubers to and from airports, the total amount of money you're spending to go somewhere in the U.S. might actually be the same amount you would spend going somewhere in Asia or Europe. Savvy travelers should plan out a complete budget, including the cost of taxis, rental cars, food and drink, and excursions. Tips to maximize your spring break without breaking the bank. If you're thinking about hitting the open seas, cruise lines are offering some big savings right now. Roller coasters, go-kart racing, water parks, not on land, but at sea. And with several new ships arriving this year, cruises can be found at all price points, like this three-night cruise in the Bahamas for under 300 bucks per person, or a seven-night voyage for two on the Mediterranean for 2,900. As travel restrictions ease, families are ready to hit the high seas. Well, I think there was an appetite for people who really wanted to travel and really weren't doing it during the pandemic. Colleen McDaniel is the editor-in-chief of CruiseCritic.com. Why is cruising back in such a big way? Cruising is bringing new ships. They are loaded with amenities and things to do. Activities like go-kart racing or rock wall climbing, all these cool things that you can do ashore, you can now do on a cruise ship. Just how big is this wave of reservations? Celebrity Cruises had its largest booking day ever on Black Friday. Holland America up 20% from 2019. And Royal Caribbean had its biggest booking day in the company's 53-year history. Among the most popular destinations, Alaska and Northern Europe's British Isles, Greenland and Iceland. McDaniel says start by working with a travel agent, especially if you've never cruised before. And don't pick based on price. Tell the agent what you want to do. Pricing will be a part of it, but it shouldn't be the biggest factor because if you don't have that great ship, you're not going to have the perfect experience. If you're booking the cruise yourself, look for discounted gift cards on websites like Rays or CardCash.com. We found this one a $500 value for $430. If you apply several gift cards to your purchase, the savings really add up. <laughs> So how do you make the most of your experience and save money once you're on board the ship? Well, to show you, I'm here on The Gem by Norwegian Cruise Lines. And with me, Stephanie Cardell. She's the director of communications. So, Steph, what should folks think about once they set foot on board? Sure. There's so much to do on board. Everybody loves to dine and eat when they're on board the ship. So make sure you go down and get your specialty dining package if you haven't done so yet. Same with your unlimited beverage package. You know, if you want to spend days around the pool um, having your favorite cocktail, make sure to do that first. And those packages tend to save you more money than if you bought la la carte. Absolutely. And then you have some tips on saving on the rooms too. 
Yep. Let's go check those out. Great. So Steph, what do you need to think about when it comes to accommodations if you're on a budget? It really depends what type of traveler you are, right? Or if you're traveling solo, we have studio staterooms, right? So they're designed and priced for the solo traveler. If you're looking to just spend um, more of your time outside, enjoying the pool deck, enjoying the bars, the entertainment, then an inside stateroom might be for you. Or if you're looking to spread out in more luxurious accommodations or if you have a large family, something like this, the three bedroom Haven Villa, might be a great option for you. And you can split the cost if you're traveling with another couple or some other friends. Absolutely. It's like having your apartment out at sea. Thank you. My pleasure. The cost of drinks can really add up on a cruise, but check out cruiselead.com. They have a drink calculator that can help you figure out which drink package to save you the most money. However you vacation, grab some me time. The best time to save on the spa when the ship is docked. You have a secret tip for saving at the spa. What's that? So on port days, there's always a special. So keep an eye out. You'll get a notice in your room, and that'll tell you what that special is for the port. And the better deals are as the cruise is getting closer to its end. Up next, sharing a home share. From planning to safety, what to figure out before your next dream vacation so it doesn't turn into a nightmare. And later, what you need to know about new subscription services at popular restaurants. That's all ahead on Consumer Confidential. Welcome back to Consumer Confidential. It's become an alternative to hotels and resorts renting a vacation home. And it could be a good way to save money. Here's a step-by-step -step guide to finding the perfect vacation home for your next trip. Need an escape from the daily grind? For your next family vacation, you could relax by the pool at this home in Port St. Lucie, Florida for $333 a night. Or watch the sunrise at this oceanfront condo in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina for $507 a night. Or enjoy the view from the hot tub at this luxury chalet in Steamboat Springs, Colorado for $1325 a night. These rentals all big enough to share with another family. It's a popular travel trend as many look to give their wallets a break this spring. The average family of four now spends more than $4,500 on a vacation each year. But by buddying up at a home share, you can split the cost with others, saving you money while making priceless memories. Last year, Airbnb reporting family travel nearly doubled to 98% in the U.S. alone. And a recent Verbo survey finding this year, 57% of travelers plan to take trips more often with groups of friends. To rent a big, huge, you know, three floor house or cabin would have not made financial sense. So splitting it with a family was perfect. Karen Ensley, her husband Will, and their daughter Sienna escaped to the great outdoors with some friends in the Pocono Mountains. After discussing their budgets, the two families searched Airbnb to find a spacious cabin within their price range. We wanted to make sure we had enough space so that the two families could be together but separate. Ensley says they took in the sights and the savings, as the outdoor toys included with the rental provided entertainment. The families also split the grocery bill. It ends up being cheaper than a hotel. But when vacationing, the phrase, the more the merrier, doesn't always apply. 
Travel preparedness expert Cheryl Nelson says before booking a shared space, discussing the details can help ensure everyone goes and comes back as friends. What about if you're traveling with another family on a shared vacation? What are some tips to make it out of that <laughs> intact? There's got to be some house rules that you set. Are there quiet hours? Agree on that. What about pets? Don't bring your dog if somebody else is bringing their cat. And kids, how are the kids going to play? Talk about the budget, how much space you need, and if you want to split the cost per family or per person. Nelson even suggests assigning rooms ahead of time. A lot of the times there's only one, maybe two master suites in the house. You don't want everybody fighting over that when they get there. Other topics to consider, how to split food costs, how much time to spend together and apart, sleep habits, and as Ensley learned, who does the chores? If one family's cooking, maybe the other one cleans that day and, and you kind of switch back and forth. When considering a home rental, Nelson says make safety a priority. Only rent from verified hosts. Read all the reviews about that property. You can also check out the surrounding area by entering the address on a street view map. And one more tip, you can see the recent serious crimes there if you put the address into crimemapping.com. What are some red flags you should look for in a listing? If they don't provide any sort of picture of a doorway or external pictures, that might raise a red flag. Nelson shows us her first safety check. Does the rental have a smoke detector and a carbon monoxide alarm? You can also bring your own. This one's portable. All you do is plug it into the wall. She then uses a flashlight to look for hidden cameras. Ideally, I'd close the blinds, lights would be off. And as I'm lounging, I would just start pointing this at vents. If you see anything reflecting back at you, there might be a hidden camera in there. And she checks drawers for sharp objects and drugs or chemicals. Tips to keep your home share travels full of good, clean family fun. Still to come, how to avoid paying extra airline fees and later, deal or no deal, how to find the best prices at your grocery store. We're back after this. Welcome back. Consumers are already battling inflation, and now it seems we're also seeing more of those so-called junk fees charged by airlines. NBC's Tom Costello spoke to our friends on the Today Show about a new policy that could make flying cheaper. It's a travel hassle familiar to any family traveling with kids. Either shell out the extra cash for seat selections up front or try to wing it at the gate. Now United Airlines is rolling out a new seating policy to make the skies a bit friendlier, allowing accompanying parents and adults to sit next to children younger than 12 without paying extra. 
That's a big deal for parents like Nathan Herrig and his family of four. It takes away one of the most stressful parts of flying, which is, you know, uh, what am I going to do with my kids on the flight? Along with the ticketing policy, United says it's also unveiling new technology that will open up more seats on its flights to help automatically keep younger children next to an adult in their party, giving access to regular economy seats and preferred seats if needed. No extra fee. It's not uncommon to see seat selection as much as 50, 60 or $70 per person. And so if you're talking about a family of four, that can run well over $200 just to reserve your specific seat. The new feature will be available to families purchasing either regular tickets or basic economy tickets, which typically have more restrictions. The move comes as regulators, lawmakers and the White House have taken sharp aim at so-called junk fees that airlines charge. We'll prohibit airlines from charging $50 round trip for family just to be able to sit together. Baggage fees are bad enough. Airlines can't treat your child like a piece of baggage. The airline industry says carriers try to seat families together, often at the gate, but families sometimes buy seats together that cost more. Experts say United's new boarding tool should remove some of the boarding stress for families. It's going to be better for uh, airline gate agents who don't have to try to play musical chairs. All right, Tom, some good tips, but if families are booking with other airlines outside of United, how can they avoid that CD yeah. fee? Yeah, let's walk through a couple of tips for you. Uh, first of all, you should try to call the airline in advance. If you're going ahead and booking online, First of all, try to see if you can book together. That may be difficult, but give it a shot. Call the airline in advance. Explain to them you're traveling with young kids. And if that doesn't work or if they simply can't help you, the agent at the gate, hopefully, at the airport can help you as well. And here's a good tip. If you're traveling with kids, try to choose maybe a seat, all seats in the back of the plane. Those usually don't fill up as fast, and usually those are not premium seats. It's easier to get seats together. Closer to the bathroom, yeah. too, by the way. Yeah. Prox in that case, with little kids, not a bad thing. How about baggage fees? Because those can really add up, too, Tom. Well, you know, if you have status, if you fly a lot, usually your status will allow you to check a bag for free. But those airline credit cards usually will give you at least one, sometimes two bags for free. So consider that using a credit card for the airline that you're on. Also compare the policies. Not all airlines charge to check bags. Southwest still does not. So you might want to be looking and considering whether that's a factor. And then if you want to try to avoid that checking the bag fee, you might want to try to carry on and then check the bag at at the gate. However, your bag can't be so big it doesn't fit through the TSA x-ray machine. It's not just airlines that are tacking on those fees, hotels, concerts, even banks too. So how can we avoid extra fees? NBC's business reporter Brian Chung recently shared some ways to cut down on costs. All right, so we're going to take it one step at a time by the by the numbers. Let's start with those dreaded banking fees. What are we working with here? Yeah, well, it costs a lot to use plastic Chanel. And the number I've got for you here is $29.80. Okay. That number comes from bank rate. That's how much it costs to overdraft. You don't have enough money in your checking account. The bank has to move from your savings account, and that's going to cost you a lot of money. So that make sure up. you have enough in your checking account. Yeah, but look, yeah. there's a lot of other fees that are associated with using bank services as well. Okay. ATM fees, $4.66. Per what? Per transaction. That's also according to bank rate. So if you want to avoid that, try to stay inside your debit card network. Take a look at the back of the plastic to make okay. sure you know where to use it. And then there's okay. also credit card late fees, right? <laughs> On top of the interest that you're going to pay for anything that's overdue, you're also yep. going to get this late fee of about $30. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is actually proposing under the Biden administration to cap that at $8. Really? And, yep, and the CFPB, again, it's a proposal right now, okay. but they say that could save Americans about $9 billion. And by the way, <laughs> Chanel, for all these fees, if you do face it, try to give your bank a call. Just say, hey, look, I'm really sorry about that. Maybe can you waive it? I've done it before with the overdraft Right, especially fee. if it's just one time. Exactly. Yeah, and the worst you, they could do, say no. Say no. Yep, okay, exactly. to save that money. All right, next, let's talk about, this is a good one, the extra costs yes. we pay for cable yep. and internet. <laughs> yeah, really expensive. And, and the number I've got for you right here is 11.3%. That's the estimated inflation that we've seen just since the beginning of the pandemic for your cable fees. Mm -hmm. And by the way, that's on top of what Consumer Reports estimated was $450 in yearly cable fees that people are paying. So fees, and not just wow. the... Just well, the, that is actually the bill, but oh, it that's includes the bill. fees, which okay. I'm going to get to right here. Company imposed fees as 
part of that are about 24% according to uh, mm -hmm. Consumer Reports. But I feel now, like it feel, you feel helpless. Like you get the bill and you have all those fees on there. What are you supposed to do? Well, you, you, I mean, you can call the cable company and try to yeah. see if you can negotiate some of those fees. But there are things like, for example, modem rentals. They'll okay. say you have to rent from us. That could be up to $15 a month. You could buy your own modem, your own router from Best Buy, for example, and then yeah. save yourself the monthly fee. Okay. And also watch out for cancellation fees. If you try to get out of a contract early, could be up to $200. But again, try to give your cable company a call. And also maybe consider cutting the cord if it's going to save you money just by streaming instead of buying a cable. But those streaming, those streaming services have all been Start jacking up. Yeah, all yeah, exactly. Yeah, so you got to do the math and try to see based off of what channels you want, whether or not it ends up working out. All right. It's crazy. All right. So if you actually get off the couch <laughs> and leave the house, we all want to do experiences. There's concerts, there's games, but the fees attached to ticketing is yep. also up. Dylan, so the number I've got for you is 27 to 31%. That's the average ticket fee. This is where we feel a lot of the pain. Mm -hmm. A lot of T-Swift fans will know this <laughs> as well, right? Now, let's do the math, right? Average concert ticket, according to uh, Polestar, is $108.20. So with another fee on top of that, mm -hmm. that's going to be another $30 just right. to get into the stadium. Average NBA game, I'm a huge Brooklyn Nets fan. I know this for a fact. $94, but again, the fees are mm -hmm. added on top of that. It's very expensive just to get inside the Barclays Arena. And then the average discount theater tickets, this is according to Today Ticks Group. They're saying it's about $55. That's not just Broadway, that's nationally, mm -hmm. by the way. Again, you're going to face fees on top of that. So, no, what can you do for that? Well, one thing you can do is you can try to go directly to the box office. In many cases, you can get around these third-party ticket mm -hmm. resellers to get around the fee. And then also remember that you can actually try to join a fan club, for example. Okay. They might offer discounted oh, tickets. that's a good idea. Well. You know what ticks yeah. me off is when you you go and you buy your movie ticket online and they charge you a convenience yes. fee? Yeah, convenience <laughs> What's fee up with what? that? What's so convenient yeah, about you're, that right you're, now? <laughs> you have fewer cashiers because I'm buying online. Stop it! Anyway, uh, travel fees. Yes, yes. What's the number? Well, there? look, I get worked up just as much about travel fees as well. 30 to $35, that is the average airfare fees just for trying to pick your seat, just mm -hmm. to try to check your bags. Right. Things you can get around, try to check the bag maybe directly at the gate. I've got other numbers for you as well. Airport car rentals, another 23% more expensive to rent at the airport. Yeah. Oh, wow. Consider taking an Uber into a downtown location. Uh -huh. Renting from the same place could mm -hmm. be a lot cheaper. Resort fees, $40 just Can you that. negotiate those? Eh, it's kind of tough, but the Biden administration is looking at perhaps nixing mm -hmm. these fees and then Airbnbs. This is where it gets, I mean, everyone's experiencing mm -hmm. this. 14.2% could be the fees on top of what you're quoted. Wow. Yeah. Check the card. Try to check out so you get a mm -hmm. final invoice and how much that's going to cost Brian you. Chung, great it's good advice. Thanks so much. Yep. Coming up, how to stretch your dollars at the grocery store, plus what you need to know about new subscription services at popular restaurants. With more Americans turning to discount stores to cope with high food prices, many traditional grocery stores are trying to lure back customers by pushing their own store brands and expanding loyalty programs. Here's how you can find the best deals. In aisles all across America, grocery shoppers are doing a double take. That's not even a cart full of groceries. As inflation sent food prices soaring, now more than half of all Americans, a whopping 60%, prefer non-traditional stores. Wholesale clubs like Costco or super centers such as Target and Walmart are often the go-to destination for food shoppers. 
That's causing a shuffle on the shelves. Some retailers to stay competitive for consumers are going to put items that are staple items on sale. They're also upping rewards on loyalty programs. As the grocery wars heat up, traditional chains like Kroger are leaning into their ability to provide fresh produce and relying on reputation to establish their own brand loyalty. What we find is uh, customers going from national brand to our brands and a customer is able to save 7 to 10 percent on a basket of goods when they buy our brands. They're also leaning into digital coupons, a big hit with shoppers. For us, our business model is designed to be successful regardless of the environment. The changing landscape can mean good news at the checkout. Stores like Aldi, which continue to expand, entice customers with cheap prices on popular brands. I think the prices are really good and they have a lot of good options. And I really like the frozen food section. I save about $100 at least a month. Discount stores are making a deep dent, too. I spent $35 on a week's worth of groceries at Dollar Tree. With one in five people shopping for groceries at Dollar Chains. They want you to see that they have the exact same quality of a name brand for much less. And often you'll see a comparison between the two prices, two big stickers right next to each other. Retailers like Dollar Tree are even remodeling some stores to showcase groceries and kitchen staples and partnering with delivery app Instacart to reach new customers. With so many choices, if you want to keep your grocery budget in check, experts suggest jump on those buy one, get one offers for your essential goods and freeze what you don't use. Set up a meal plan for the week to limit overspending. And don't forget to take advantage of those loyalty programs that can cut costs in line. Take a beat before you go to the grocery store and really do the research. You will be so surprised how much money you can save. Now to a closer look at big changes happening in the food industry. Some restaurants are offering deals like subscription services and extra perks to keep customers coming back. NBC's Kaylee Hartung has the latest. From chicken to beef to eggs, the price you pay for food at the grocery store remains high. And restaurants, big and small, are feeling that same sting from inflation. Food is getting outrageous. Many businesses have been forced to pass on those costs to consumers, making the price you pay for dine-in and takeout meals more expensive. 8% more than you paid for the same meals last year. That ballooning bill, the main reason over 60% of Americans say they're choosing to eat out less often. I feel like I'm paying more money for either not very much food or not very good food. Now restaurants are trying to turn down the heat on inflation while still cooking up deals for their customers. Some restaurants are even offering subscription plans. At Asian food chain P.F. Chang's, patrons can now pay $6.99 a month for exclusive loyalty perks, including double reward points, jumping to the front of the waitlist for a table, and free delivery. Industry insiders say that new revenue stream will help relieve some of the inflation stress on businesses. Have you all had to adjust your prices to reflect inflation costs? There's no secret that prices had to be adjusted, not only at our restaurant, but really everywhere, right? At this location in Los Angeles, employees say they're firing up more meals for P.F. Chang subscribers every day. Do you feel that people are really saving money by paying a subscription fee? I believe so. If you're a loyal customer and this is the place that you go to all the time, it's definitely worth it. At Panera Bread, a $120 annual subscription will get you into its unlimited sip club, where drinks and deliveries are available without any additional fees. Some smaller chains and local restaurants are thinking outside the box, offering inflation-conscious menus with options that are cheaper than a full-price plate. And restaurant operators are becoming pretty innovative in terms of how they operate in this extremely high-cost environment. If you're looking to dine out without breaking the bank, look for daily specials, which often offer a side and a drink for less. Opt for a late lunch instead of a more expensive dinner portion. And if you plan to carry out, see if you can order directly online or through the restaurant's app to help avoid extra delivery fees. That's our time for now. Be sure to join me for another edition of Consumer Confidential right here on Today All Day. For all of us at NBC News, I'm Vicki Wynn.
pizza, the golden crust, the tangy sauce, and that ooey gooey cheese. It's no surprise that this divine creation is one of America's most popular foods. But in the countless pizzerias I've been to, it's still pretty rare to see a woman tossing dough or tending a giant oven. I'm Elena Besser. I'm a professional chef, recipe developer, and content creator, so I'm constantly curious about who is making my meals. Now I'm heading out to meet the women breaking barriers in the pizza world today and creating more space for everyone at the table. Mankind has been eating flatbreads for centuries, but the modern pizza was invented in Naples, Italy. It was popular among the working class who needed meals that were quick and cheap. When Queen Margarita of Savoy visited Naples in the late 1800s, Chef Raphael Esposito served her a pie inspired by Italy's national colors. The Queen's approval turned this humble street food into a royal favorite. So you could say it was a woman who really put pizza on the world map. I think the love from pizza is something I always say, uh, I think is my blood. Georgia Capruccio owns Manhattan's Don Antonio, known for its classic Neapolitan pies. While New York City has thousands of pizzerias, very few are actually owned by women. What do your guests say when they walk into the restaurant and they see a woman standing at the pizza oven making their pizza? So some of the people are, are really, I can see from the face, they're surprised. Wow. And they bring the kids, they bring their daughter to see, to have, you know, pizza and it's super fun. Georgia is one of only two women to ever win one of Italy's largest pizza competitions, a feat she accomplished at just 21 years old. Her victory surprised everyone, including Georgia herself. It was crazy. My father signed for me. Wait, so he signed you up to compete in this competition yeah. and you had no idea? No idea, zero idea. Five minutes before the competition started, he came to me and said, oh, by the way, I signed up for you. Georgia placed first in the classic pizza category, cementing her love for the craft and giving her shop a major boost. I never, never imagined that I was, you know, I can win, I was super happy. That moment, it was unique because I remember feel free, feel, feel super light. Growing up on a dairy farm in Terracina, Italy, Georgia's love for pizza started early. Tell me some of your earliest food memories. So my grandmother, for example, she was making pizza for me okay. every Sunday with just tomato sauce and oregano, so really simple. So I that's true grandma-style pizza from yeah. grandma herself. Georgia's grandmother may have introduced her to pizza, but it was her father, Roberto Capruccio, that made it a true family obsession. Roberto left his family and moved to Naples to study the art of pizza making. Georgia was just eight years old, so she rarely saw him growing up. By the early 2000s, Roberto's culinary chops brought him to the U.S. His restaurant, Keste, is touted as serving some of the best pizza in New York City. Did you ever think that you would end up in food one day? Never. Never. Also, when I first arrived over here, like I come in like New York for learn English mm -hmm. and never imagine. So the only option for me to, to know my father or to understand what he was doing is stay with him. This is why I started to make pizza. So Georgia moved to the States to reconnect with her father. Georgia was the only woman assembling pies in the kitchen, so she was motivated to prove she belonged. And also everybody, all the co-workers was make fun of me because Why? I was because I don't know how to make pizza. I don't cook at home. So yeah. you're like, I'll show you. She shadowed her father for three years, but Roberto wanted his daughter to train harder. He sent her to Naples to study with his former mentor. She was the only female apprentice in her class. What were the responses from the other people that were learning alongside you, those men. So like they don't they don't feel that I can do like I can be successful or I can be or you know reach a high level of you know be a pizza maker because they say oh one day you have kids so you stay home. Did you ever respond to them or did you just ignore them? I ignore my pizza is my business card. Georgia returned to the US with a renewed determination to make pizza her profession. She opened Don Antonio with her father in 2012. When did you have that spark where you realized 
oh my goodness, this is what I'm gonna do for my career. When uh, I opened Don Antonio, so, okay. and uh, I was really in charge of everything in the kitchen. But in that moment I say, I need to be the best. There's this term going around right now called Nepo baby, where it's the concept oh, yeah. of nepotism. But you have really taken time to learn the craft and do the work to prove yourself. So do you feel like you've been able to move outside of your dad's shadow? No, yet. Georgia says customers are still surprised that she's running the shop these days, not her famous father. He never saw a lot daughter follow, you know, pizza maker, uh, father pizza maker. After working 13 hour days for nearly a decade, she's had to take a step back with her first child on the way. Working in a kitchen, I can speak from experience, it is incredibly physically demanding. Yes. So how have you had to adapt as you've seen your body change? So I changed completely. <laughs> I need to change completely. Uh, so before I was really strong. Uh, I don't need to eat, I don't need to sleep a lot. Today, 10% of people working in the food and hospitality industries have access to some type of parental leave. Georgia is keenly aware she's in a unique position. I'm really lucky because I can organize myself in my job, mm -hmm. the other woman cannot. Right, you're, a, you're the boss, so you can call the shots and that actually works to your advantage. Yes. At Don Antonio, I was ready to see this boss get to work. Italy, just like the US, is home to many different regional styles of pizza. Georgia specializes in Neapolitan pizza, which is prized for its simplicity and high quality ingredients. The dough, the tomatoes, the types of cheese, and the techniques are all strictly regulated by two associations based in Naples. Georgia used to train chefs with the Associazione Pizzaioli Napoletani. So I was ready to learn from a true pizzaiola. What is the first step? So we start with the tomato. Neapolitan pizzas must be topped with tomatoes grown close to Naples. So basically I crush like that. Ooh, that must feel nice. Yes. The base of the dough uses water, fresh yeast, salt, and imported double zero flour, which refers to its super fine grind. This dough has been fermenting for a full day. So you can see the bubbling. Nice. So Neapolitan pizza, the characteristic is the bubble crust. The dough is cut and shaped into little balls, which rest for another five hours. Now we need to start to make the pizza. This is Semolina. See the... Look at the bubbles. It's yes. alive. So now, what pizza maker, Neapolitan pizza maker do is like just push the air. Okay. Oh wow, and you can see all of that air is pushing out to create that crust. Can I try? Yeah. It feels so fluffy. After the dough is stretched, it's time for the toppings. First up, the tomato sauce. So one exactly spoon. Now we put basil. Pecorino. Okay, and that's a little saltier than traditional Parmesan. The pizza is finished with a hefty handful of mozzarella and a generous drizzle of fruity extra virgin olive oil. Then it's ready for the oven. And that's it. I love it. Ready to go. To the oven. The key to a stellar Neapolitan pizza is an incredibly hot wood-burning oven. This one, brought over from Italy, burns at a scorching 900 degrees. So it only takes two minutes for the pies to cook. There we go. Wow. This is your pizza. This is stunning. God. Cheers. Cheers. Oh my goodness. Wow. This is the crust that you want on the bottom. Like thin, but you have the crunchy also. I cannot handle how much flavor is in such simplicity. I am in heaven.
At Don Antonio in New York City, I couldn't wait to try Georgia's award-winning Montanara, a fried pizza. Fried pizza is one of the oldest pizza. It was invented and created in Naples. And no you can find way. It. Yes. Wow, I had no idea. So if you see the movie with the Sofia Loren, uh -huh. the gold of Naples, okay. she was fried on the street. Women are tied to fried pizza. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, so, so the women in the Naples so try to help and sustain a the family. They were right. really poor, poor mm -hmm. family. Mm -hmm. So they start to fry and sell on the street. The okay, pizza. amazing. So yeah. it really all started with the women. Let's yes. not forget that. Yes. <laughs> Georgia fries the same traditional dough to a golden brown. Then she tops it with tomato sauce, pecorino, basil, and smoked buffalo mozzarella. To get that gooey melted cheese, she finishes the pie in the oven for less than a minute. Wow, it looks so puffy. It almost looks like focaccia. It's the most delicious and simple. You got that crispy crust on the outside but you're still getting such a doughy, light, fluffy center. You need to try at least one time in your life. Absolutely, are you kidding? I had no idea that this exists. Despite her success, Georgia knows there's still a long way to go when it comes to representation in the pizza world. In 2019, she helped co-found Women in Pizza, an organization that helps support and connect chefs, restaurant owners, and food entrepreneurs. Two of Georgia's closest friends from the group stopped by Don Antonio. The friendship that we create is more really tight, much deep friendship that you can create in the pizza world. Alexandra Mortati was inspired to start the group after talking to many women in the restaurant world with shared experiences. Alexandra, you've talked about how women are often hidden in pizza shops. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, I think a lot of times women get slotted into roles that people think they're best fit for. Mm -hmm. Because you're a woman, maybe you seem more nurturing, they want to put you in management. Or maybe you're really good with people, they want to put you as the hostess or somewhere in the front. But what you might be interested in is making the pizza. And you have to fight a lot harder for them to give you that space to prove yourself. Nicole Russell, a pizza maker who hosts the show Pizza Wars, agrees. Women just have different challenges and different barriers to entry than the average guy. And it's like, you know, one thing about being in Women in Pizza is that a lot of times when we do the show demos, I'll be the only woman with all the guys. And they're just so dominant and like, you know, we're also passionate about making right. pizza, you know? And we all can't wait to just make the pizza. But sometimes you just gotta, uh, uh get right. out the way, <laughs> you know what I mean? So I think it's important that, you know, you always hear about a grandma slice, but actually you see a grandma representation. Yeah. <laughs> like you hear the grandma slice, but where's the grandma? Where is the grandma? Right, yeah. right, Nona's at home, right? Well, bring Nona out. Yes. So that's what Women in Pizza is kind of about. All love, but just showcasing more, you know, how much women are a force in this industry. And I think now there's a lot more room where men are mentoring younger women and women are mentoring younger women um, and empowering them and it wouldn't be possible without women like georgia and nicole cheers ladies cheers, cheers. 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 pizza <gasps> women in pizza yeah to women in pizza
I live in the Big Apple, there are plenty of incredible pizza restaurants with pretty much every type of slice you can imagine. But there's a surprising place down south where folks are really flipping out for something special. I want to be throwing dough. I want to be covered in flour and pizza sauce. It's kind of like my serenity. Welcome to Tulsa, Oklahoma, where the famed Route 66 runs right into the historic downtown. This city is known for its Art Deco buildings and world-class museums dedicated to music legends Woody Guthrie and Bob Dylan. But unlike many visitors, I'm not here to dive into memorabilia. I'm here to meet Tara Hatton, a rising star on the national pizza scene. Oh my gosh, it's so great to finally meet you. Yeah. I'm obsessed with the door, master of this domain, <laughs> Tara Hatton. That's, that's epic, I love it. <laughs> Look at this beautiful restaurant. So we're just kind of a late 80s, early 90s themed pizzeria. That's what we love as okay. a 90s baby. I, I'm all here for it. <laughs> and you're a 90s baby as well. Barely. Barely. At 26 years old, Tara already owns two locations of Zaza's Pizza and Wings, a brand she founded. The name is a nod to the infamous Joey Zaza from The Godfather Part 3. Here, Tara is putting her own spin on a classic pizza shop with some very non-traditional offerings. So these are all of our slice pies. We'll usually keep like the basics and stuff that people come in to try, like of course pepperoni, cheese, right. sausage. And then we kind of have some of our weird stuff going on, of course. Pickles. Our pickle pie, and believe it or not, is one of our best selling pizzas. No way. Tara started working in pizza when she was 16, honing her skills at local pizzerias before meeting her mentor, Mike Bausch of Andalini's Pizza, a small pizza empire in Tulsa. Mike and his brother were in and out of the restaurants all the time, and he came in and he saw me throwing dough, and every time he came in, that's what he saw me doing. So he was like, I, you're good at this, aren't you? I'm like, mm. Good was an understatement. Mike recognized that Tara had a natural talent for throwing dough, so he started teaching her some basic acrobatic tricks. Yup, this is a real sport. Professional pizza acrobats spin, toss, and twirl dough at competitions around the world. During three to five minute choreographed routines, they're judged on the number of tricks they perform and their difficulty. One of the most well-known pizza competitions is the Pizza Games at Las Vegas' Pizza Expo, where pros from around the globe gather each spring. This year, Tara is competing in her fifth games. As usual, she'll be one of the only female competitors. I didn't even learn what <laughs> pizza throwing was. I saw this guy that I worked with at like my first ever pizzeria kind of doing it. And they had told me about Pizza Expo. And at that time, it was just like a dream to go to Pizza Expo. Tara has come a long way since a disappointing last place finish at her first pizza games. Reflecting on that time, she says her head and heart were elsewhere grieving the loss of her mother, the woman who sparked her love for cooking as a child. I just kind of fell into like making food and stuff at home with my mom. Her, my grandma, long line of like women who cook and making recipes and that was kind of what we would leave like down to our kids, but right. it was just cookbooks. When Tara returned to Vegas the following year, she had a new purpose. I made the reason I was going there worth everything that I kind of put into it. When I placed first in the preliminaries, it was such like a powerful moment. It actually fell on the anniversary of when she had passed away. So I was like, oh my gosh, like this is because of you, like you help me. <laughs> yeah. And it was kind of at that moment where I was like, everything is like paid off. When Tara's not wowing crowds, she's busy making some of Tulsa's most unique pizzas. So we headed to her prep kitchen where 500 pounds of dough gets made into over 1,000 pies every day. So our dough, we're gonna start with a local uh, milled flour. And then we of course got our yeast, salt, and olive oil. Great. Best way to kind of start dough is by activating the yeast. Okay. So we usually activate it in some hot water, warm water, like 101 is usually ideal. It's gonna smell really nice in here very soon. Yes. So give it a whisk. Great. And then once we kind of wake the yeast up in here, we're gonna put it to sleep in some ice water. Your turn. <laughs> <laughs> it's cold. That's how you check your pain tolerance. Yeah, exactly. You know? It's funny that the whole point of this is to put the yeast to sleep when I'm feeling 
more awake than ever with how cold this is on my fingers. Now this is pretty bubbly, so we got a nice little foamy layer in there. And then we'll just throw this in with our flour. We already got some dough that's been mixing this morning. The dough Tara uses for tricks doesn't have any yeast, so it stays dense like Play-Doh. Back at Zaza's, it was time to learn some tossing tricks Woo! with a few new friends. Good job, good job, guys. Each month, for Tara holds a pizza making you. and throwing class for kids and parents at her shop. I'm a little older than her typical student, but I could not wait to join in on the fun. We're gonna take it across our, our body. Okay. And then throw it up. <laughs> and then throw it up in the air. Yeah, just like that. One, two, three. <laughs> I just kind of spin it like on my finger, like like my knuckles almost. Okay. Well, you have to get it going first. Yeah. Right? The best trick I show people okay. that's pretty easy is throwing it behind your shoulder. Okay. Show if you me that. put your arm out, you know, like your little teapot, short and stout, okay. you know, and then you just look that way and throw it. It's like doing a cartwheel. I didn't, mean, it's not. Around, around the shoulder. Mm -hmm. Just like effortless. She's effortless. She's a world champion. With the competition in Vegas fast approaching, I joined Tara and her mentor Mike for a practice session. Pleasure to meet you. Mike, you're the whole reason why Tara got into this, so can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, I'm a dork for pizza, and her dorkage has just latched on to us, and it's exciting. It's about the love of pizza making, and this is a representation of that. So are we <laughs> gonna get a chance to see the full routine right now? I mean, I guess. I guess we can do it. Oh my gosh. Tara uses silicone doughs to practice. They create the feel of acrobatic pizza dough without the floury mess. Transitioning from hand to hand is what will give her more points. Okay. And then going behind the back seamlessly. Some people will really lean into one trick and try and make it last 30 seconds. Okay. She's going a trick per second. Oh, oh. There it is. Okay. That's the Terra that Classic. Is. That's her signature move. Unbelievable. Hi, <laughs> girl. Woo! Here at Zaza's Pizza in Tulsa, pizza acrobat Tara Hatton is making waves with her signature moves and unique pies. I couldn't wait to make one of her fan favorites, a chicken and waffle pizza. So you're essentially taking the Zaza's pizza and wings and you're creating a, a child with them of <laughs> chicken and waffle pizza. <laughs> yes, they are all my precious pizza baby. <laughs> we love, we love. This pizza uses a blend of margarine and butter as a base on top of the olive oil. So this doesn't have a sauce on it, does it? No, it's just gonna be like the oil and the butter. Okay, the so. olive oil is just gonna be like a sheen to protect the dough itself. And then the butter will kind of melt and create these little soup pools that'll be perfect for when we put our waffles on. And it'll just like soak up all that butter. Baby, baby is speaking my delicious. language. With our buttery base ready, Tara and I add boneless chicken wings and mozz cheese. 
Then it was time for something sweet. Our secret little ingredient. We're gonna add yes. some syrup. Yes, look at this. It's so wrong. It's right. <laughs> so a little bit of a, a swirl. Little swirl. So it kind of bakes into the base and stuff, and almost like caramelizes on there. The pizza bakes at 555 degrees until the crust turns golden brown before the final topping. It's smelling so good in here. It smells breakfast. like breakfast. <laughs> Jinx. Oh, we can't Wait, forget the Mike's Hot the Honey. most important part. Grizzle me timbers. Pizza time. Cheers. Cheers. So you get a combination of crunch and fluff with a little bit of that salty cheese. And, and then, then it's the, just hot. And then the hot honey. It's good. It slaps. <laughs> Of course, I couldn't leave Zaza's without trying the famous pickle pizza. I could see a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle eating this right now. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers with your hot slice of pizza. Oh my god. It's got that punchy vinegar pickle taste, and the cheese mellows it out. I never knew that a pickle on a pizza would work so well. It does. I don't like pineapple on pizza, but like pickle on pizza, mm -hmm. that's my move. Before heading back to New York, I had one more pizza party to attend. My friend and owner of Zaza's Pizza Wings, Tara Hatton. Tara's routine wowed friends and fans of all ages who came to wish her well before the big competition. <laughs> Taking it all the way back to where you first began in the kitchen with your mom and grandma <laughs> to where you are today. If they could see you now, what do you think they would say? I would like to say that they are definitely proud. I don't think they would expect what I'm doing now compared to where my like original game plan was in life. I think they would realize it's not just pizza to me. It is my life, it is my world, and I love it. <laughs> Tara placed second in the Masters Acrobatic Competition in Vegas. And she can't wait to come back and compete for the title again next year. Pizza is the ultimate comfort food. With so many unique styles, sauces, and toppings, it's truly impossible to go wrong. As pizza has evolved over the years, so have the chefs behind this iconic Italian staple. Whether they're cooking pies, running front of house, or going all out on stage, the women making pizza today are creating more space at the table for everyone. Hello, hello, welcome to the boost on this international day of happiness. So our goal today is to boost your inner happiness. So we're gonna share joyful stories behind a few viral TikTokers, but what do you say we kick it off with the story of how a faithful text brought the ultimate joy to one woman and one man's life? Jenna Bush Hager has that story. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. It was the Bible verse Brenda Rivera from Georgia intended to text a friend in 2009, but a typo in the phone number sent it to a stranger. I get a reply back saying, amen to that, who is this? Isaiah Stern, 600 miles away in Ohio, got the message. And I'm like, oh, it's Brenda. It was a wrong text that led Brenda to Mr. Right. He replied back, my name's Isaiah Stearns, we've never met, but by the looks of your text, I can see that you love God, that's awesome. Some people might think, okay, this is somebody I don't know, never mind, but what yeah. made you decide to respond? I viewed it as, oh, this is another person who can uh, help me in my walk with God. It's always good to have yes. good friends, so I, I was very encouraged by that. The next day, Brenda's phone rang. She let it go to voicemail. He just sounded very genuine and he sounded kind of cute. So I was like, you know what? I'm gonna give him a call back. Yeah, the rest is history. The mishap was serendipitous. Isaiah got a new phone plan with a new number just 30 minutes before the text came through. Just how everything uh, was orchestrated, we 100% believe that it was from God. A friendship built on faith evolving into a meaningful relationship 
Brenda and Isaiah talked every day. I started feeling like maybe I really liked this guy, but I was hesitant to let my heart feel just because I never really met him. Brenda's mom, who also lived in Ohio, got to meet him first. You so went on a date with her mom before you went on a date with her? Yes. And what did your mom say after the date? And I'm like, okay, mom, like from one to 10, what do you rate this guy? Without hesitation, she said, 11, you're gonna marry this guy. They finally met in person weeks later. I felt an immediate connection, even more so than we already had. Isaiah, three months after you met in person, yeah. you yes. proposed. Yes. You knew basically right away. Yeah, there was no reason to waste time. We had a really deep connection and I was like, I need to step out in faith and do this because I'll never find another woman like this in my life. Brenda and Isaiah have been married for 13 years and have six kids together, ranging in age from 11 to one. Hi, everybody. Look at your big, beautiful family. Could y'all have ever dreamed? How did I get so lucky? This is rich. This is wealthy right here. They say life as a family of eight is not always easy, but it's their love that gets them through. A love they hope others are inspired to find. There's no right way to find somebody. Don't close yourself off. Don't build up walls. It's important to be vulnerable. Love is everywhere. You don't have to try hard to look for it. Just let yourself feel it. <laughs> And now Donna catches up with a professor at UCLA to bring us some unique tips on how to add more happiness to your day. The way we spend our time and how we approach our time has a significant influence on how happy we are. In her new book, Happier Hour, author Cassie Holmes offers up ways to make each hour in your day feel more fulfilling. The thing we can control is how we spend our time. Cassie gave me some tips and exercises from the book to help bring my attention to the joy right in front of me. The first exercise was to do a random act of kindness. I just met Ken at the airport. I bought him a coffee. He was in line behind me. Cheers. Cheers. Kindness, pass it around. I have to tell you, this changed me. And then I sat down for my four hour flight, initially had my earbuds in, but then for three out of the four hours, I ended up talking and having a conversation with my seatmate and we became friends. And the sense of connection that comes from even an interaction with a stranger, mm -hmm. the sort of sense of belonging. Yes, it's with close others, but it's also the extent to which we feel connected to our communities and humanity. Next up, Cassie suggested I experience awe. I spent some time in Wyoming and I was horseback riding, which I love doing. Come on, monk. These sights are truly spectacular. But I was also so awe-inspired by the mountains, the view, the fresh air, the stargazing. When you go into nature, and you are inspired and filled with awe, what that does, it expands your perspective and expands your sense of time that you then feel less limited. You're not concerned about your schedule. But I actually felt like time was sitting still for a little bit in the best way. One tip Cassie gave me was to make my most joyful activities, like spending time with my parents, no phone zones. I love having morning coffee with my mom. I love going on walks with my dad. And I'm always snapping pictures, documenting, trying to make these memories. What you helped me realize was making the memories is also through just being present, not having to capture it or document. These are your most joyful activities. And carving those out, and making them no out. phone zones, it's really important because it not only affects your enjoyment, but the person that you're with, your mom and your dad, know that you're fully present. My biggest takeaway is I've identified the activities that boost my mood when I'm feeling down. And if we can control our own happiness, then that is one step towards improving it. This next woman found that the only way for her to boost the happiness in her daily life was to leave everything she knew behind. 
The fruit trees on Orcas Island, Washington, have been bearing apples and pears and plums for more than a century. But for years, most of the fruit has fallen to the ground, unused, until Audra Lawler came along. Coming here felt like cleaning the slate, starting over. And when I started looking around, all I knew was it was this beautiful place. Lawler left a lucrative career on Wall Street and was in search of something more. I looked at the women who were supposed to be my role models, but I realized that I didn't want their lives. And I said, that's a problem. <laughs> she cherished the San Juan Islands since vacation trips there as a child. She got married near here and thought she'd live here someday until she realized, why not now? September came and the fruit started dropping from the trees. And I started frantically making pies, as many pies as I could stick in my freezer. Once, the San Juan Islands were the fruit basket of the Pacific Northwest. The fruit industry moved inland when the Columbia River was dammed. The trees stayed put. All right, so what's going on here? All right, so these are orcas pears. They're a varietal that we use to make our orcas pear with bay jam, which is kind of our signature. A brand and a business born of the opportunity from all those forgotten fruit trees. Girl meets dirt. May I ask you a question? Yeah. Why do we think the orca's pear blushes? It usually blushes in the spot where the sun shines on it. Oh, it's not embarrassed? No, it, maybe a little bit. <laughs> Lawler, who was once a wizard of Wall Street, has found a calling and a second career as an alchemist, making jams and fruit concoctions from centuries-old recipes. What are you thinking as you are over these cauldrons and the aroma is just so great? I'm thinking that we're working on little pots of magic. <laughs> It's all very storybook. Audra and husband Jerry find success and happiness far from the big city. But starting a family was discouragingly difficult. So she turned to the earth. I walked out to my garden and I put my hands in the dirt and I started digging. After five miscarriages and certain children were not in her future. I started the business and then miraculously didn't do anything differently and my sixth pregnancy was my son who's now almost five. And then my daughter was a complete surprise, now almost three. A little bit like um, fresh ginger. We wondered if Audra believed there was a connection. Yeah, that was my church. <laughs> that was my, my faith. And proof perhaps that for everything, there is a season. I have to pause sometimes and breathe <laughs> and realize what my husband and I have created. We've created the life that we always wanted. Back here on The Boost with a few stories we know you're going to want to chow down on. First, the creative way one man is changing the way we consume our food. I'm a food artist. I've done hundreds of pieces over the years, and something that started out as a hobby, I could see myself doing for the rest of my life. Harley Langberg is a 34-year-old dad and partner at an investment company, but his side hustle? Playing with his food. His creativity dates back to his childhood. Having grown up in New York City with some of the best museums, galleries, street art, 
and then taking art history classes. I've had such an appreciation for art and my favorite is mixed media. And in a sense, that's what I'm creating today. While studying for a business degree at Northwestern University, Harley also completed a culinary program before moving back to the Big Apple. I was living in the meatpacking district near Chelsea Market. They had a food art photography exhibition throughout the walls of the market. And I remember standing in front of each piece for like 15 minutes, you know, just admiring it, trying to figure out the ingredients. And I said, you know what, I want to try this. Since that moment, nine years ago, Harley has put his own flavor on paper or should we say plates? Once I decide on an image, I will take that image on my iPhone, go right to Whole Foods as I'm running around the produce section, trying to match up all the colors and trying to match up the textures. And then I'll get the ingredients, come home, get to work, take out my cutting board, my knife, my food art plate, and my toothpicks. Over time, he's tried and tested the most fruitful ingredients for food art. Cookie dough is such a fun ingredient to work with because you can dye it any color. It's almost like clay or Play-Doh. You can mold it, you can shape it, you can sculpt it. I almost always use either eggplant or plum and turnip because it looks really great when you photograph it. One of the most unusual ingredients I've used is dried anchovies. Silver and gray is a tricky color and those really have a natural, beautiful silver gray quality to them. Harley's menu masterpieces have included celebrity portraits, landscapes, holidays, animals, and more. One of my favorite portraits that I did is of Serena Williams. I'm a huge tennis fan, and when she retired, I wanted to do a piece that would commemorate this momentous occasion. And I used cookie dough that I dyed with food coloring, pasta, which I always love to use for the hair, Sarah belts for her clothing, and I wanted to create a 3D component, so I carved a lemon to look like a tennis ball, which was a lot of fun. Sometimes they'll just do a character. White Lotus was super popular and I loved it, so of course I had to do Tanya, which got a really great response from everybody. One of my favorite pieces is my tiger. It's almost like ready to jump out at you. I use soy sauce to dye the mashed potatoes brown. Rice noodles for the whiskers and the hair to really bring a lot of texture. And I used some yellow pepper, some red potato. Some of Harley's pieces take up to five hours to complete. One of the pieces that took the most time to create was my sushi platter Oreo. I remove the top cookie, I take all the cream, and then I mix it with food coloring, and then I will create an image on that cookie. And it's very challenging because you're working on a very tiny surface area, but you know, I, I really enjoy a challenge. For Harley's nearly 40,000 social media followers, his art is a sight for sore eyes and hungry stomachs. I think the fact that food is so universal and so global is really what gets people excited because they can see really like, oh wow, I had that for dinner last night and now it's, you know, a portrait. Not everything you do in life is fulfilling. I find that fulfilling, being able to inspire others. Next up, would you sit down for a sandwich with a total stranger? Well, this next woman traveled outside of her comfort zone by doing just that and went viral in, on TikTok in the process. It really has like restored my faith in humanity. I'm amazed at the nice people that I meet. My life kind of completely got turned upside down. <laughs> For Katie Scar, life started to roll in a different direction, all because of sandwiches. Hi, would you eat a sandwich with a stranger in New York City? AKA me, I am the stranger. That video spread through TikTok, gaining almost 400,000 views. So I decided to go on a sandwich date. Why did you decide to start doing this? I love meeting people, but I'm very, very shy and awkward around a lot of people. Honestly, during the pandemic, I got a little lonely and I felt the need to like push myself to get out and be doing more things. So I just was like, I'm gonna force myself to like go meet new people and randomly decided to put it on TikTok. I had never posted a TikTok before. I had no idea how it even worked. I had no idea what would happen happened, which is that I got like 500 emails in a week. So you get 500 emails. How do you decide which one you were going to answer and, and then go meet that person? Because that's it's not true. something I would tell my kid to do. Yeah, no, that's true. Every single person that emailed me almost, except for maybe like five out of the 500, were genuinely nice people. People would often include their social media information so that I could look them up and see that they were real people. And honestly, I have kind of been following my gut and, and making sure that I'm safe. Since January of this year, Katie's been going on a weekly sandwich date with all sorts of people. 
My great date Jabari is a lawyer. This week we are joined by Jane. Meet Vanessa. Jonathan is a great dad. He takes his sons on all kinds of adventures. <laughs> Breaking the ice and bread at a variety of New York City eateries. Who doesn't like a sandwich? Yeah, yeah. It's a, you know, sandwich is a casual. Hey, let's meet up. Let's have a sandwich. I have a sandwich. That's true. There's such a variety of sandwiches. Mm -hmm. They're casual, fairly inexpensive. Mm -hmm. It's like such a low pressure way to meet somebody. Have you kept up with people that you've had sandwiches? Yes, I have. I've, I've kept up with all of them to some degree, some more than others. There's a woman that I met that I had no idea when I reached out to her that we work in the exact same office building. So we've we've hung out. I met someone that I'm actually oh, like no. kind of dating in real life. Kind of kind of dating. Oh, hold on, <laughs> Ricky, come on over here. How did your sandwich date with uh, with Katie go? I thought it was pretty, thing, thing it will run pretty well. Uh, obviously. So you got a sandwich and you made a love connection. And I made a love connection. So thank you, honey. It's, it's like, can I have a, an extra side of love? Okay, question section. In her TikTok videos, Katie includes a quick interview section with her dates. What is your proudest accomplishment in life? What is your favorite memory from your life? What is currently bringing you the most joy in life? Trying new things. Planning a trip to Ireland. Connecting with people. So I, of course, got grilled as well. What is your proudest accomplishment in life? I would say uh, my kids. They bring me joy. They also suck the life out of me <laughs> every day, but nothing makes me happier. While connecting with others, Katie has also reflected a lot about herself. I get nervous every single time. I'm convinced that the person is going to not like me or be like, oh, she was not interesting. But I just, my feet walk there, I show up, and, and then everything goes so much better than I thought it would. <laughs> it almost sounds like you're saying, and the sandwich helps, to just show up. <laughs> yeah, just show up in life for anything. Like, just, just get your feet on the ground and show up. <laughs>this next woman detailed her coming out journey in her memoir a revelation that inspired her whole family a coming out is a process that we spend our lifetime evolving into or at least that's how i think about it jesse hempel grew up the eldest of three daughters for decades her family struggling behind closed doors falling to the pressures of hidden shame and secrets within the span of, of five years just about your entire family comes out. How, how'd that happen? This will give it away that I'm an oldest child, Al. I like to say that I was first. I came out of the closet in college, although truthfully in my heart, I knew from the very beginning that I was, something was different about me. Jesse revealing her truth in 1996, perhaps sparking a ripple effect 
And that's the family outing. I came home from college and I told my parents and my mom cried. And then she said, I love you. And my dad said nothing. Then the next morning he came into the kitchen and he said, well, you know, I thought I was gay once too. And I nearly dropped my spoon and I said, well, what did you do, dad? And he said, oh, you know, I married your mom. And he walked out of the room. Three years later, Jesse's dad at 50 announcing he was gay. My entire family dissembled. It was a messy, multi-year process, and it was very, very painful. And in our own pain, we weren't necessarily the best to each other. Soon after, Jesse's sister coming out as bisexual, then her brother as transgender. Somehow, 20 years later, that process of self-revelation and of coming back to each other has left us extraordinarily tight-knit. What was your reaction to your dad? I was like, oh, dad, sure you're gay. And then a few years later, my sister comes out and my, my reaction is like, oh, whatever, you just want to be like everybody else. And then when my brother comes out, I immediately start looking back and thinking, well, that's ridiculous, because I remember last Christmas, he wore a dress. If he wore a dress, why does he say this now? I wish I could go back and just rewind time and do it over. Um, because I realized that that was about my own fear about change and not at all about listening well to them. What was your mother's reaction to your, your father coming out? It was hugely surprising to her, as it was to my father. He had been internally closeted. He, you know, my parents had been unhappy for a really long time. And so it forced my mom to have to reconceive of how she thought of her life. What is remarkable about my parents is that when their marriage blew up, instead of running away from the hard work of self-reflection, they ran right at it. And what that gave us is the information that we could also change and evolve. It sounds like, Jesse, this 20-year sojourn has left you and your family stronger than, than you, you could have possibly been 20 years ago. Certainly stronger. I'm not gonna try to tell you that everything is a fairy tale. It's a family, it has ups, it has downs. Jessie is now married with a family of her own. You've got two beautiful kids. When they're old enough to read this book, what do you hope they draw from it? Well, the thing that I hope happens for them is that they always live in a state of coming out coming more closely in tune with who they are meant to be and always feeling like they can express themselves. I, I think most people want to be supportive, want to to accept who the, uh, uh, their, their loved one is, but they're not quite sure what to say or how to respond. I think the first step is to say, thank you for telling me. But the next best thing to say is, tell me more. That those three words can be really powerful. Taking a turn to the viral TikTok star surprising unsuspecting street vendors in the best possible way. If there's anything more refreshing than a cold paleta on a hot day, it's the sight of massive TikTok tips like this going viral for all the right reasons. This is Jesus Morales, a.k.a. Juicy on TikTok, the man behind the hands filled with cash, and he searches out unsuspecting street vendors to give them gifts they can hardly believe. What's it like for you when you try to hand somebody $100 <laughs> and you know they need it, yeah. and they give it back and they're like, no, 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 I can't take it. The Latino community is hardworking, and they don't expect handouts. So it's like, it's really weird for it to happen, but Again, I always like let them know, like, hey, this money comes with a lot of blood. So far, he's given away hundreds of thousands of dollars donated by his followers. My parents came here with nothing, like absolutely nothing besides a dream. And when they first came to the U.S., they were living, they were sleeping in a basement on a piece of cardboard. And I just like imagine that. And it's just like, dude, like my parents have sacrificed so much just to be here. And, you know, we tagged along on one of Jesus's famous surprise taco stand takeovers. Oh, Jesus has now told them that he is going to help promote their business. They don't know about what's coming afterwards. Uh, but now you're just giving free tacos to everybody. Free tacos for an hour. Free tacos. Tacos gratis, gratis. Come get your free tacos, guys. Free tacos. Into the, the hour, the total bill just over a grant. <laughs> they said that and just with what they ate, it was about $50. So they think he's going to be spending a lot of money here. Plus an extra $1,000 tip. Y luego lo demás va a ser una propina para todos ustedes. Muchas gracias. 
So she just said that the owner of the stand, his son was involved in, in an accident today, uh, was hit by a car, and he's in the hospital, and so they're, they're here working. Uh, but this couldn't have come at, at a better time for this family. How often do you come and, and give somebody a tip or do something like this, and then they say, this came at the exact right time? It happens pretty often, to be quite honest, and, you know, I'm glad that we're able to help out. It's a reminder every day, you know, everybody goes, everybody, you know, street vendors, regular people, you know, being able to do things like this for them is just, it just means the world to me. And soon he'll set out again, hoping to lift up others, working towards their American dream. We're back here on The Boost, and we've got another fun video for you for today. Take a look. There's an 11-year-old boy in Nebraska. His name is Elijah. He's battling a brain tumor. Well, Elijah has always dreamt of having his own puppy, and thanks to Make-A-Wish, his dream came true. <laughs> you remember him? He's so cute. <laughs> Oh my God. Wow, Elijah that's awesome. overcome. That's his new best friend right there. That, by the way, that do that's the exact dog, exact dog that Elijah has always wanted. A black, brown, and white corgi puppy, and he got her. Named him Tucker, oh. a name he picked out a long time ago when he was still dreaming about that little one. Uh, the first thing he said to Tucker was, uh, I love you. Did you like our show? It's been pretty joyful. Make sure to remember those tips and tricks to help boost your happiness today and every day. And guess what? We'll see you right back here tomorrow on Today All Day. And thanks for joining us for another episode of Consumer Confidential. I'm Vicki Wynn. As consumers deal with high inflation, we're continuing to help you save money while dining out to cutting costs at the grocery store. But first, we are all thinking about our next vacation. So how can you find the best spring travel deals? Spring is in the air, and after years of missing out, college students and families are making spring break a priority this season with hotspots in Florida, the Southwest, and south of the border at the top of the list, according to travel booking site Hopper. If you're headed to a very popular warm weather spring break destination, you should be booking your flight now. Travel costs are not immune to inflation. Hotel rates are up 64% from last year, and flights cost 20% more. But there are spring break deals out there. Hopper advertising $82 round trip flights to Orlando from New York, Boston to San Diego for $190, and Newark round trip to Turks and Caicos for $260. But the clock is ticking. Families heading to vacation hotspots should book as soon as possible. Prices might rise by more than $200 a ticket in the weeks closer to spring break. Expect full flights and hotels and make contingency plans in case of flight cancellations. For budget-conscious travelers, be flexible. Midweek flights can be up to $100 cheaper per person. 
wait to book big city hotels. Last minute room deals can save you up to 25% and consider a staycation. One of the best ways to get an incredible deal when you do a staycation is to reach out to local hotels or accommodation providers. Ask if they have a geofenced rate. Hotels often will offer a lower rate to residents of the town, the community, sometimes even the state, to incentivize locals to stay at their accommodations. Meanwhile, international travel has also roared back with Asian destinations like China, Japan and Indonesia reopening post-pandemic and attracting crowds of young people eager to experience a new part of the world and take advantage of the strong dollar. When you add up hotel, eating out, Ubers to and from airports, the total amount of money you're spending to go somewhere in the U.S. might actually be the same amount you would spend going somewhere in Asia or Europe. Savvy travelers should plan out a complete budget, including the cost of taxis, rental cars, food and drink, and excursions. Tips to maximize your spring break without breaking the bank. If you're thinking about hitting the open seas, cruise lines are offering some big savings right now. Roller coasters, go-kart racing, water parks, not on land, but at sea. And with several new ships arriving this year, cruises can be found at all price points, like this three-night cruise in the Bahamas for under 300 bucks per person, or a seven-night voyage for two on the Mediterranean for 2,900. As travel restrictions ease, families are ready to hit the high seas. Well, I think there was an appetite for people who really wanted to travel and really weren't doing it during the pandemic. Colleen McDaniel is the editor-in-chief of CruiseCritic.com. Why is cruising back in such a big way? Cruising is bringing new ships. They are loaded with amenities and things to do. Activities like go-kart racing or rock wall climbing, all these cool things that you can do ashore, you can now do on a cruise ship. Just how big is this wave of reservations? Celebrity Cruises had its largest booking day ever on Black Friday. Holland America up 20% from 2019. And Royal Caribbean had its biggest booking day in the company's 53-year history. Among the most popular destinations, Alaska and Northern Europe's British Isles, Greenland and Iceland. McDaniel says start by working with a travel agent, especially if you've never cruised before. And don't pick based on price. Tell the agent what you want to do. Pricing will be a part of it, but it shouldn't be the biggest factor because if you don't have that great ship, you're not going to have the perfect experience. If you're booking the cruise yourself, look for discounted gift cards on websites like Raise or CardCash.com. We found this one a $500 value for $430. If you apply several gift cards to your purchase, the savings really add up. <laughs> So how do you make the most of your experience and save money once you're on board the ship? Well, to show you, I'm here on The Gem by Norwegian Cruise Lines. And with me, Stephanie Cardell. She's the director of communications. So, Steph, what should folks think about once they set foot on board? Sure. There's so much to do on board. Everybody loves to dine and eat when they're on board the ship. So make sure you go down and you get your specialty dining package if you haven't done so yet. Same with your unlimited beverage package. You know, if you want to spend days around the pool um, having your favorite cocktail, make sure to do that first. And those packages tend to save you more money than if you bought la la carte. Absolutely. And then you have some tips on saving on the rooms too. Yep. Let's go check those out. Great. So Steph, what do you need to think about when it comes to accommodations if you're on a budget? It really depends what type of traveler you are, right? Or if you're traveling solo, we have studio staterooms, right? So they're designed and priced for the solo traveler. If you're looking to just spend um, more of your time outside, enjoying the pool deck, enjoying the bars, the entertainment, then an inside stateroom might be for you. Or if you're looking to spread out in more luxurious accommodations or if you have a large family, something like this, the three bedroom Haven Villa, might be a great option for you. And you can split the cost if you're traveling with another couple or some other friends. Absolutely. It's like having your apartment out at sea. Thank you. My pleasure. The cost of drinks can really add up on a cruise, but check out cruiselead.com. They have a drink calculator that can help you figure out which drink package to save you the most money. However you vacation, grab some me time. The best time to save on the spa when the ship is docked. You have a secret tip for saving at the spa. What's that? So on port days, there's always a special. So keep an eye out. You'll get a notice in your room, and that'll tell you what that special is for the port. And the better deals are as the cruise is getting closer to its end. Up next, sharing a home share. From planning to safety, what to figure out before your next dream vacation so it doesn't turn into a nightmare. And later, what you need to know about new subscription services at popular restaurants. That's all ahead on Consumer Confidential.
Welcome back to Consumer Confidential. It's become an alternative to hotels and resorts renting a vacation home. And it could be a good way to save money. Here's a step-by-step -step guide to finding the perfect vacation home for your next trip. Need an escape from the daily grind? For your next family vacation, you could relax by the pool at this home in Port St. Lucie, Florida for $333 a night. Or watch the sunrise at this oceanfront condo in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina for $507 a night. Or enjoy the view from the hot tub at this luxury chalet in Steamboat Springs, Colorado for $1325 a night. These rentals all big enough to share with another family. It's a popular travel trend as many look to give their wallets a break this spring. The average family of four now spends more than $4,500 on a vacation each year. But by buddying up at a home share, you can split the cost with others, saving you money while making priceless memories. Last year, Airbnb reporting family travel nearly doubled to 98% in the U.S. alone. And a recent Verbo survey finding this year, 57% of travelers plan to take trips more often with groups of friends. To rent a big, huge, you know, three-floor house or cabin would have not made financial sense. So splitting it with a family was perfect. Karen Ensley, her husband Will, and their daughter Sienna escaped to the great outdoors with some friends in the Pocono Mountains. After discussing their budgets, the two families searched Airbnb to find a spacious cabin within their price range. We wanted to make sure we had enough space so that the two families could be together but separate. Ensley says they took in the sights and the savings, as the outdoor toys included with the rental provided entertainment. The families also split the grocery bill. It ends up being cheaper than a hotel. But when vacationing, the phrase, the more the merrier, doesn't always apply. Travel preparedness expert Cheryl Nelson says before booking a shared space, discussing the details can help ensure everyone goes and comes back as friends. What about if you're traveling with another family on a shared vacation? What are some tips to make it out of that <laughs> intact? There's got to be some house rules that you set. Are there quiet hours? Agree on that. What about pets? Don't bring your dog if somebody else is bringing their cat. And kids, how are the kids going to play? Talk about the budget, how much space you need, and if you want to split the cost per family or per person. Nelson even suggests assigning rooms ahead of time. A lot of the times there's only one, maybe two master suites in the house. You don't want everybody fighting over that when they get there. Other topics to consider, how to split food costs, how much time to spend together and apart, sleep habits, and as Ensley learned, who does the chores? If one family's cooking, maybe the other one cleans that day and, and you kind of switch back and forth. When considering a home rental, Nelson says make safety a priority. Only rent from verified hosts. Read all the reviews about that property. You can also check out the surrounding area by entering the address on a street view map. And one more tip, you can see the recent serious crimes there if you put the address into crimemapping.com. What are some red flags you should look for in a listing? If they don't provide any sort of picture of a doorway or external pictures, that might raise a red flag. Nelson shows us her first safety check. Does the rental have a smoke detector and a carbon monoxide alarm? You can also bring your own. This one's portable. All you do is plug it into the wall. She then uses a flashlight to look for hidden cameras. Ideally, I'd close the blinds, lights would be off. And as I'm lounging, I would just start pointing this at vents. If you see anything reflecting back at you, there might be a hidden camera in there. And she checks drawers for sharp objects and drugs or chemicals. Tips to keep your home share travels full of good, clean family fun. Still to come, how to avoid paying extra airline fees and later, deal or no deal, how to find the best prices at your grocery store. We're back after this.
Welcome back. Consumers are already battling inflation, and now it seems we're also seeing more of those so-called junk fees charged by airlines. NBC's Tom Costello spoke to our friends on the Today Show about a new policy that could make flying cheaper. It's a travel hassle familiar to any family traveling with kids. Either shell out the extra cash for seat selections up front or try to wing it at the gate. Now United Airlines is rolling out a new seating policy to make the skies a bit friendlier, allowing accompanying parents and adults to sit next to children younger than 12 without paying extra. That's a big deal for parents like Nathan Herrig and his family of four. It takes away one of the most stressful parts of flying, which is, you know, uh, what am I going to do with my kids on the flight? Along with the ticketing policy, United says it's also unveiling new technology that will open up more seats on its flights to help automatically keep younger children next to an adult in their party, giving access to regular economy seats and preferred seats if needed. No extra fee. It's not uncommon to see seat selection as much as 50, 60 or $70 per person. And so if you're talking about a family of four, that can run well over $200 just to reserve your specific seat. The new feature will be available to families purchasing either regular tickets or basic economy tickets, which typically have more restrictions. The move comes as regulators, lawmakers, and the White House have taken sharp aim at so-called junk fees that airlines charge. We'll prohibit airlines from charging $50 round trip for family just to be able to sit together. Baggage fees are bad enough. Airlines can't treat your child like a piece of baggage. The airline industry says carriers try to seat families together, often at the gate, but families sometimes buy seats together that cost more. Experts say United's new boarding tool should remove some of the boarding stress for families. It's going to be better for uh, airline gate agents who don't have to try to play musical chairs. All right, Tom, some good tips, but if families are booking with other airlines outside of United, how can they avoid that CD yeah. fee? Yeah, let's walk through a couple of tips for you. Uh, first of all, you should try to call the airline in advance. If you're going ahead and booking online, First of all, try to see if you can book together. That may be difficult, but give it a shot. Call the airline in advance, explain to them you're traveling with young kids, and if that doesn't work or if they simply can't help you, the agent at the gate, hopefully, at the airport can help you as well. And here's a good tip. If you're traveling with kids, try to choose maybe a seat, all seats in the back of the plane. Those usually don't fill up as fast, and usually those are not premium seats. It's easier to get seats together. Closer to the bathroom, yeah. too, by the way. Yeah. Prox in that case, with little kids, not a bad thing. How about baggage fees? Because those can really add up, too, Tom. Well, you know, if you have status, if you fly a lot, usually your status will allow you to check a bag for free. But those airline credit cards usually will give you at least one, sometimes two bags for free. So consider that using a credit card for the airline that you're on. Also compare the policies. Not all airlines charge to check bags. Southwest still does not. So you might want to be looking and considering whether that's a factor. And then if you want to try to avoid that checking the bag fee, you might want to try to carry on and then check the bag at the gate. However, your bag can't be so big it doesn't fit through the TSA x-ray machine. It's not just airlines that are tacking on those fees, hotels, concerts, even banks too. So how can we avoid extra fees? NBC's business reporter Brian Chung recently shared some ways to cut down on costs. All right, so we're going to take it one step at a time by the by the numbers. Let's start with those dreaded banking fees. What are we working with here? Yeah, well, it costs a lot to use plastic Chanel. And the number I've got for you here is $29.80. Okay. That number comes from bank rate. That's how much it costs to overdraft. You don't have enough money in your checking account. The bank has to move from your savings account, and that's going to cost you a lot of money. So that make sure up. you have enough in your checking account. Yeah, but look, yeah. there's a lot of other fees that are associated with using bank services as well. Okay. ATM fees, $4.66. Per what? Per transaction. That's also according to bank rate. So if you want to avoid that, try to stay inside your debit card network. Take a look at the back of the plastic to make okay. sure you know where to use it. And then there's also credit card late fees, right? <laughs> On top of the interest that you're going to pay for anything that's overdue, you're also yep. going to get this late fee of about $30. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is actually proposing under the Biden administration to cap that at $8. Really? And, yep, and the CFPB, again, it's a proposal right now, okay. but they say that could save Americans about $9 billion. And by the way, <laughs> Chanel, for all these fees, if you do face it, try to give your bank a call. Just say, hey, look, I'm really sorry about that. Maybe can you waive it? I've done it before with the overdraft right. Especially fee. if it's just one time. Exactly. And yeah, the worst you... they could do, 
say no. Say no. Yep, okay, exactly. to save that money. All right, next, let's talk about, this is a good one, the extra cost yes. we pay for cable yeah. and internet. <laughs> yeah, really expensive. And, and the number I've got for you right here is 11.3%. That's the estimated inflation that we've seen just since the beginning of the pandemic for your cable fees. Mm -hmm. And by the way, that's on top of what Consumer Reports estimated was $450 in yearly cable fees that people are paying. So fees, and not just wow. the... Just well, the, that is actually the bill, but oh, it that's includes the bill. fees, which okay. I'm going to get to right here. Company imposed fees as part of that are about 24%, according to uh, mm -hmm. Consumer Reports. But I feel now, like it feel, you feel helpless. Like, you get the bill and you have all those fees on there. What are you supposed to do? Well, you, you, I mean, you can call the cable company and try to yeah. see if you can negotiate some of those fees. But there are things like, for example, modem rentals. They'll okay. say, you have to rent from us. That could be up to $15 a month. You could buy your own modem, your own router mm -hmm. from Best Buy, for example, and then yeah. save yourself the monthly fee. Okay. And also watch out for cancellation fees. If you try to get out of a contract early, could be up to $200. But again, try to give your cable company a call. And also maybe consider cutting the cord if it's going to save you money just by streaming instead of buying a cable. But those streaming, those streaming services have all been Start jacking up. Yeah, all yeah, exactly. Yeah, so you got to do the math and try to see based off of what channels you want, whether or not it ends up working out. All right. It's crazy. All right, so if you actually get off the couch <laughs> yep. and leave the house, we all want to do experiences. There's concerts, there's games, but the fees attached to ticketing is yep. also up. Dylan, so the number I've got for you is 27 to 31%. That's the average ticket fee. This is where we feel a lot of the pain. Mm -hmm. A lot of T-Swift fans will know this <laughs> as well, right? Now, let's do the math, right? Average concert ticket, according to uh, Polestar, is $108.20. So with another fee on top of that, mm -hmm. that's going to be another $30 just right. to get into the stadium. Average NBA game, I'm a huge Brooklyn Nets fan. I know this for a fact. $94, but again, the fees are mm -hmm. added on top of that. It's very expensive just to get inside the Barclays Arena. And then the average discount theater tickets, this is according to Today Ticks Group. They're saying it's about $55. That's not just Broadway, that's nationally, mm -hmm. by the way. Again, you're going to face fees on top of that. But there's so, no, what can you do for that? Well, one thing you can do is you could try to go directly to the box office. In many cases, you can get around these third-party ticket mm -hmm. resellers to get around the fee. And then also remember that you can actually try to join a fan club, for example. Okay. They might offer discounted tickets. Oh, that's a good idea. Well. Oh, it ticks yeah. me off is when you you go and you buy your movie ticket online and they charge you a convenience yes. fee? Yeah, convenience what's fee. What's up with what? that? What's so convenient yeah, about you're, that right you're, now? You have fewer cashiers because I'm buying online. Stop it! <laughs> anyway, uh, travel fees. Yes, yes. So what's the number well, there? Well, look, I get worked up just as much about travel fees as well. 30 to $35, that is the average airfare fees just for trying to pick your seat, just mm -hmm. to try to check your bags. Right. Things you can get around, try to check the bag maybe directly at the gate. I've got other numbers for you as well. Airport car rentals, another 23% more expensive to rent at the airport. Yeah. Oh, wow. Consider taking an Uber into a downtown location. Uh -huh. Renting from the same place could mm -hmm. be a lot cheaper. Resort fees, $40. Just can you that. negotiate those? Eh, it's kind of tough, but the Biden administration is looking at perhaps mixing mm -hmm. these fees and then Airbnbs. This is where it gets, I mean, everyone's experiencing mm -hmm. this. 14.2% could be the fees on top of what you're quoted. Wow. Yeah. Check the card. Try to check out so you get a mm -hmm. final mm -hmm. invoice and how much that's going to cost Brian you. Chung, great. It's good advice. Thanks so it much. Yep. Coming up, how to stretch your dollars at the grocery store, plus what you need to know about new subscription services at popular restaurants.
With more Americans turning to discount stores to cope with high food prices, many traditional grocery stores are trying to lure back customers by pushing their own store brands and expanding loyalty programs. Here's how you can find the best deals. In aisles all across America, grocery shoppers are doing a double take. That's not even a cart full of groceries. As inflation sent food prices soaring, now more than half of all Americans, a whopping 60 percent, prefer non-traditional stores. Wholesale clubs like Costco or super centers such as Target and Walmart are often the go-to destination for food shoppers. That's causing a shuffle on the shelves. Some retailers to stay competitive for consumers are going to put items that are staple items on sale. They're also upping rewards on loyalty programs. As the grocery wars heat up, traditional chains like Kroger are leaning into their ability to provide fresh produce and relying on reputation to establish their own brand loyalty. What we find is uh, customers going from national brand to our brands and a customer is able to save 7 to 10 percent on a basket of goods when they buy our brands. They're also leaning into digital coupons, a big hit with shoppers. For us, our business model is designed to be successful regardless of the environment. The changing landscape can mean good news at the checkout. Stores like Aldi, which continue to expand, entice customers with cheap prices on popular brands. I think the prices are really good and they have a lot of good options. And I really like the frozen food section. I save about $100 at least a month. Discount stores are making a deep dent, too. I spent $35 on a week's worth of groceries at Dollar Tree. With one in five people shopping for groceries at Dollar Chains. They want you to see that they have the exact same quality of a name brand for much less. And often you'll see a comparison between the two prices, two big stickers right next to each other. Retailers like Dollar Tree are even remodeling some stores to showcase groceries and kitchen staples and partnering with delivery app Instacart to reach new customers. With so many choices, if you want to keep your grocery budget in check, experts suggest jump on those buy one, get one offers for your essential goods and freeze what you don't use. Set up a meal plan for the week to limit overspending. And don't forget to take advantage of those loyalty programs that can cut costs in line. Take a beat before you go to the grocery store and really do the research. You will be so surprised how much money you can save. Now to a closer look at big changes happening in the food industry. Some restaurants are offering deals like subscription services and extra perks to keep customers coming back. NBC's Kaylee Hartung has the latest. From chicken to beef to eggs, the price you pay for food at the grocery store remains high. And restaurants, big and small, are feeling that same sting from inflation. Food is getting outrageous. Many businesses have been forced to pass on those costs to consumers, making the price you pay for dine-in and takeout meals more expensive. 8% more than you paid for the same meals last year. That ballooning bill, the main reason over 60% of Americans say they're choosing to eat out less often. I feel like I'm paying more money for either not very much food or not very good food. Now restaurants are trying to turn down the heat on inflation while still cooking up deals for their customers. Some restaurants are even offering subscription plans. At Asian food chain P.F. Chang's, patrons can now pay $6.99 a month for exclusive loyalty perks, including double reward points, jumping to the front of the waitlist for a table, and free delivery. Industry insiders say that new revenue stream will help relieve some of the inflation stress on businesses. Have you all had to adjust your prices to reflect inflation costs? There's no secret that prices had to be adjusted, not only at our restaurant, but really everywhere, right? At this location in Los Angeles, employees say they're firing up more meals for P.F. Chang subscribers every day. Do you feel that people are really saving money by paying a subscription fee? I believe so. If you're a loyal customer and this is the place that you go to all the time, it's definitely worth it. At Panera Bread, a $120 annual subscription will get you into its unlimited sip club, where drinks and deliveries are available without any additional fees. Some smaller chains and local restaurants are thinking outside the box, offering inflation-conscious menus with options that are cheaper than a full-price plate. And restaurant operators 
are becoming pretty innovative in terms of how they operate in this extremely high cost environment. If you're looking to dine out without breaking the bank, look for daily specials, which often offer a side and a drink for less. Opt for a late lunch instead of a more expensive dinner portion. And if you plan to carry out, see if you can order directly online or through the restaurant's app to help avoid extra delivery fees. That's our time for now. Be sure to join me for another edition of Consumer Confidential right here on Today All Day. For all of us at NBC News, I'm Vicki Wynn. Pizza, the golden crust, the tangy sauce, and that ooey gooey cheese. It's no surprise that this divine creation is one of America's most popular foods. But in the countless pizzerias I've been to, it's still pretty rare to see a woman tossing dough or tending a giant oven. I'm Elena Besser. I'm a professional chef, recipe developer, and content creator, so I'm constantly curious about who is making my meals. Now I'm heading out to meet the women breaking barriers in the pizza world today and creating more space for everyone at the table. Mankind has been eating flatbreads for centuries, but the modern pizza was invented in Naples, Italy. It was popular among the working class who needed meals that were quick and cheap. When Queen Margarita of Savoy visited Naples in the late 1800s, Chef Raphael Esposito served her a pie inspired by Italy's national colors. The Queen's approval turned this humble street food into a royal favorite. So you could say it was a woman who really put pizza on the world map. I think the love from pizza is something I always say, uh, I think is my blood. Georgia Capruccio owns Manhattan's Don Antonio, known for its classic Neapolitan pies. While New York City has thousands of pizzerias, very few are actually owned by women. What do your guests say when they walk into the restaurant and they see a woman standing at the pizza oven making their pizza? So some of the people are, are really, I can see from the face, they're surprised. Wow and they bring the kids, they bring their daughter to see, to have, you know, pizza, and it's super fun. Georgia is one of only two women to ever win one of Italy's largest pizza competitions, a feat she accomplished at just 21 years old. Her victory surprised everyone, including Georgia herself. It was crazy. My father signed for me Wait, so he signed you up to compete in this competition yeah. and you had no idea? No idea. Zero idea. Five minutes before the competition started, he came to me and said, Oh, by the way, I signed up for you. Georgia placed first in the classic pizza category, cementing her love for the craft and giving her shop a major boost. I never, never imagined that I was, you know, I can win. I was super happy. That moment it was unique because I remember it feel free, feel, feel super light. Growing up on a dairy farm in Terracina, Italy, Georgia's love for pizza started early. Tell me some of your earliest food memories. So my grandmother, for example, she was making pizza for me okay. every Sunday with just tomato sauce and oregano, so really simple. So I that's true grandma-style pizza from yeah. grandma herself. Georgia's grandmother may have introduced her to pizza, but it was her father, Roberto Capruccio, that made it a true family obsession. Roberto left his family and moved to Naples to study the art of pizza making. Georgia was just eight years old, so she rarely saw him growing up. By the early 2000s, Roberto's culinary chops brought him to the U.S. His restaurant, Keste, is touted as serving some of the best pizza in New York City. Did you ever think that you would end up in food one day? Never. Never. Also, when I first arrived over here, like I come in like New York for learn English mm -hmm. and never imagine. So the only option for me to, to know my father or to understand what he was doing is stay with him. 
This is why I started to make pizza. So Georgia moved to the States to reconnect with her father. Georgia was the only woman assembling pies in the kitchen, so she was motivated to prove she belonged. And also everybody, all the co-workers was make fun of me because Why? I was, because I don't know how to make pizza. I don't cook at home. So yeah. you're like, I'll show you. She shadowed her father for three years, but Roberto wanted his daughter to train harder. He sent her to Naples to study with his former mentor. She was the only female apprentice in her class. What were the responses from the other people that were learning alongside you, those men. So like they don't they don't feel that I can do like I can be successful or I can be or you know reach a high level of you know be a pizza maker because they say oh one day you have kids so you stay home. Did you ever respond to them or did you just ignore them? I ignore my pizza is my business card. Georgia returned to the US with a renewed determination to make pizza her profession. She opened Don Antonio with her father in 2012. When did you have that spark where you realized, oh my goodness, this is what I'm gonna do for my career? When uh, I opened Don Antonio. So, okay. And uh, I was really in charge of everything in the kitchen. By that moment I say, I need to be the best. There's this term going around right now called Nepo baby, where it's the concept oh, yeah. of nepotism. But you have really taken time to learn the craft and do the work to prove yourself. So do you feel like you've been able to move outside of your dad's shadow? Not yet. Georgia says customers are still surprised that she's running the shop these days, not her famous father. He never saw a lot daughter follow, you know, pizza maker, uh, father pizza maker. After working 13 hour days for nearly a decade, she's had to take a step back with her first child on the way. Working in a kitchen, I can speak from experience, it is incredibly physically demanding. Yes. So how have you had to adapt as you've seen your body change? So I changed completely. <laughs> I need to change completely. Uh, so before I was really strong. Uh, I don't need to eat, I don't need to sleep a lot. Today, 10% of people working in the food and hospitality industries have access to some type of parental leave. Georgia is keenly aware she's in a unique position. I'm really lucky because I can organize myself in my job, mm -hmm. the other woman cannot. Right, you're, a, you're the boss, so you can call the shots and that actually works to your advantage. Yes. At Don Antonio, I was ready to see this boss get to work. Italy, just like the US, is home to many different regional styles of pizza. Georgia specializes in Neapolitan pizza, which is prized for its simplicity and high quality ingredients. The dough, the tomatoes, the types of cheese, and the techniques are all strictly regulated by two associations based in Naples. Georgia used to train chefs with the Associazione Pizzaioli Napoletani. So I was ready to learn from a true pizzaiola. What is the first step? So we start with the tomato. Neapolitan pizzas must be topped with tomatoes grown close to Naples. So nice. basically I crush like that. Ooh, that must feel nice. Yes. The base of the dough uses water, fresh yeast, salt, and imported double zero flour, which refers to its super fine grind. This dough has been fermenting for a full day. So you can see the bubbling. Nice. So Neapolitan pizza, the characteristic is the bubble crust. The dough is cut and shaped into little balls, which rest for another five hours. Now we need to start to make the pizza. This is Semolina. See the... Look at the bubbles. It's yes. alive. So now, what pizza maker, even Neapolitan pizza maker do is like just push the air. Okay. Oh wow, and you can see all of that air is pushing out to create that crust. Can I try? Yeah. It feels so fluffy. After the dough is stretched, it's time for the toppings. First up, the tomato sauce. So one exactly spoon. Now we put basil, pecorino. Okay, and that's a little saltier than traditional Parmesan. The pizza is finished with a hefty handful of mozzarella and a generous drizzle of fruity extra virgin olive oil. Then it's ready for the oven. And that's it. I love it. 
ready to go to the oven. The key to a stellar Neapolitan pizza is an incredibly hot wood-burning oven. This one, brought over from Italy, burns at a scorching 900 degrees, so it only takes two minutes for the pies to cook. There we go. Wow. This is your pizza. This is stunning. God. Cheers. Cheers. Oh my goodness. Wow. This is the crust that you want on the bottom. Like thin, but you have the crunchy also. I cannot handle how much flavor is in such simplicity. I am in heaven. At Don Antonio in New York City, I couldn't wait to try Georgia's award-winning Montanara, a fried pizza. Fried pizza is one of the oldest pizza that was invented and created in Naples. And no you can find way. It. Yes. Wow, I had no idea. So if you see the movie with the Sofia Loren, uh -huh. the gold of Naples, okay. she was fried on the street. Women are tied to fried pizza. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, so, so the women in the Naples so try to help and sustain the family. They were right. really poor, poor mm -hmm. family. Mm -hmm. So they start to fry and sell on the street. The okay, pizza. amazing. So yeah. it really all started with the women. Let's yes. not forget that. Yes. <laughs> Georgia fries the same traditional dough to a golden brown. Then she tops it with tomato sauce, pecorino, basil, and smoked buffalo mozzarella. To get that gooey melted cheese, she finishes the pie in the oven for less than a minute. Wow, it looks so puffy. It almost looks like focaccia. It's the most delicious and simple. You get that crispy crust on the outside but you're still getting such a doughy, light, fluffy center. You need to try at least one time in your life. Absolutely, are you kidding? I have no idea that this exists. Despite her success, Georgia knows there's still a long way to go when it comes to representation in the pizza world. In 2019, she helped co-found Women in Pizza, an organization that helps support and connect chefs, restaurant owners, and food entrepreneurs. Two of George's closest friends from the group stopped by Don Antonio. The friendship that we create is more really tight, much deep friendship that you can create in the pizza world. Alexandra Mortati was inspired to start the group after talking to many women in the restaurant world with shared experiences. Alexandra, you've talked about how women are often hidden in pizza shops. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, I think a lot of times women get slotted into roles that people think they're best fit for. Mm -hmm. Because you're a woman, maybe you seem more nurturing, they want to put you in management. Or maybe you're really good with people, they want to put you as the hostess or somewhere in the front. But what you might be interested in is making the pizza. And you have to fight a lot harder for them to give you that space to prove yourself. Nicole Russell, a pizza maker who hosts the show Pizza Wars, agrees. 
women just have different challenges and different barriers to entry than the average guy. And it's like, you know, one thing about being in Women in Pizza is that a lot of times when we do the show demos, I'll be the only woman with all the guys. And they're just so dominant and like, you know, we're also passionate about making right. pizza, you know? And we all can't wait to just make the pizza. But sometimes you just gotta, uh, uh get right. out the way, <laughs> you know what I mean? So I think it's important that, you know, you always hear about a grandma slice, but actually you see a grandma representation. Yeah. <laughs> like you hear the grandma slice, but where's the grandma? Where is the grandma? Right, yeah. right, Nona's at home, right? Well, bring Nona out. Yes. So that's what Women in Pizza is kind of about. All love, but just showcasing more, you know, how much women are a force in this industry. And I think now there's a lot more room where men are mentoring younger women and women are mentoring younger women um, and empowering them and it wouldn't be possible without women like georgia and nicole cheers, cheers ladies cheers, cheers. 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 pizza women in pizza yeah to women in pizza Where I live in the Big Apple, there are plenty of incredible pizza restaurants with pretty much every type of slice you can imagine. But there's a surprising place down south where folks are really flipping out for something special. I want to be throwing dough. I want to be covered in flour and pizza sauce. It's kind of like my serenity. Welcome to Tulsa, Oklahoma, where the famed Route 66 runs right into the historic downtown. This city is known for its Art Deco buildings and world-class museums dedicated to music legends Woody Guthrie and Bob Dylan. But unlike many visitors, I'm not here to dive into memorabilia. I'm here to meet Tara Hatton, a rising star on the national pizza scene. Oh my gosh, it's so great to finally meet you. Yeah. I'm obsessed with the door, master of this domain, <laughs> Tara Hatton. That's, that's epic, I love it. <laughs> Look at this beautiful restaurant. So we're just kind of a late 80s, early 90s themed pizzeria. That's what we love as okay. a 90s baby. I, I'm all here for it. <laughs> and you're a 90s baby as well. Barely. 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 At 26 years old, Tara already owns two locations of Zaza's Pizza and Wings, a brand she founded. The name is a nod to the infamous Joey Zaza from The Godfather Part 3. Here, Tara is putting her own spin on a classic pizza shop with some very non-traditional offerings. 
So these are all of our slice pies. We'll usually keep like the basics and stuff that people come in to try. Like of course, pepperoni, cheese, right. sausage. And then we kind of have some of our weird stuff going on, of course. Pickles. Our pickle pie, and believe it or not, is one of our best selling pizzas. No way. Tara started working in pizza when she was 16, honing her skills at local pizzerias before meeting her mentor, Mike Bausch of Andalini's Pizza, a small pizza empire in Tulsa. Mike and his brother were in and out of the restaurants all the time, and he came in and he saw me throwing dough, and every time he came in, that's what he saw me doing. So he was like, I, you're good at this, aren't you? I'm like, mm. Good was an understatement. Mike recognized that Tara had a natural talent for throwing dough, so he started teaching her some basic acrobatic tricks. Yup, this is a real sport. Professional pizza acrobats spin, toss, and twirl dough at competitions around the world. During three to five minute choreographed routines, they're judged on the number of tricks they perform and their difficulty. One of the most well-known pizza competitions is the Pizza Games at Las Vegas's Pizza Expo, where pros from around the globe gather each spring. This year, Tara is competing in her fifth games. As usual, she'll be one of the only female competitors. I didn't even learn what <laughs> pizza throwing was. I saw this guy that I worked with at like my first ever pizzeria kind of doing it. And they had told me about Pizza Expo. And at that time, it was just like a dream to go to Pizza Expo. Tara has come a long way since a disappointing last place finish at her first pizza games. Reflecting on that time, she says her head and heart were elsewhere grieving the loss of her mother, the woman who sparked her love for cooking as a child. I was kind of fell into like making food and stuff at home with my mom. Her, my grandma, long line of like women who cook and making recipes and that was kind of what we would leave like down to our kids was right. just cookbooks. When Tara returned to Vegas the following year, she had a new purpose. I made the reason I was going there worth everything that I kind of put into it. When I placed first in the preliminaries, it was such like a powerful moment. It actually fell on the anniversary of when she had passed away. So I was like, oh my gosh, like this is because of you, like you help me. <laughs> yeah. And it was kind of at that moment where I was like, everything is like paid off. When Tara's not wowing crowds, she's busy making some of Tulsa's most unique pizzas. So we headed to her prep kitchen where 500 pounds of dough gets made into over 1,000 pies every day. So our dough, we're gonna start with a local uh, milled flour. And then we of course got our yeast, salt, and olive oil. Great. Best way to kind of start dough is by activating the yeast. Okay. So we usually activate it in some hot water, warm water, like 101 is usually ideal. It's gonna smell really nice in here very soon. Yes. So give it a whisk. Great. And then once we kind of wake the yeast up in here, we're gonna put it to sleep in some ice water. Your turn. <laughs> <laughs> it's cold. That's how you check your pain tolerance. Yeah, exactly. You know? It's funny that the whole point of this is to put the yeast to sleep when I'm feeling more awake than ever with how cold this is on my fingers. Now this is pretty bubbly, so we got a nice little foamy layer in there. And then we'll just throw this in with our flour. We already got some dough that's been mixing this morning. The dough Tara uses for tricks doesn't have any yeast, so it stays dense like Play-Doh. Back at Zaza's, it was time to learn some tossing tricks Woo! with a few new friends. Good job, good job, guys. Each month, for Tara holds a pizza making you. and throwing class for kids and parents at her shop. I'm a little older than her typical student, but I could not wait to join in on the fun. We're gonna take it across our, our body. Okay. And then throw it up. <laughs> and then throw it up in the air. Yeah, just like that. One, two, three. <laughs> I just kind of spin it like on my finger, like like my knuckles almost. Okay. Well, you have to get it going first. Yeah. Right? The best trick I show people okay. that's pretty easy is throwing it behind your shoulder. Okay. Show if you me that. put your arm out, you know, like your little teapot, short and stout, okay. you know, and then you just look that way and throw it. It's like doing a cartwheel. I didn't. Mean, it's not <laughs> around around the shoulder. Mm -hmm. She's like effortless. She's effortless. She's a world champion. With the competition in Vegas fast approaching, I joined Tara and her mentor Mike for a practice session. Pleasure to meet you. Mike, you're the whole reason why Tara got into this. So can you tell us a little bit about that? 
Well, I'm a dork for pizza, and her dorkage has just latched on to us, and it's exciting. It's about the love of pizza making, and this is a representation of that. So are we <laughs> going to get a chance to see the full routine right now? I mean, I guess. I guess we can do it. Oh, my gosh. Tara uses silicone doughs to practice. They create the feel of acrobatic pizza dough without the floury mess. Transitioning from hand to hand is what will give her more points. Okay. And then going behind the back seamlessly. Some people will really lean into one trick and try and make it last 30 seconds. Okay. She's going a trick per second. Oh, oh. There it is. Okay. That's the Terra that Classic. Is. That's her signature move. Unbelievable. Hi, <laughs> girl. Woo! Here at Zaza's Pizza in Tulsa, pizza acrobat Tara Hatton is making waves with her signature moves and unique pies. I couldn't wait to make one of her fan favorites, a chicken and waffle pizza. So you're essentially taking the Zaza's Pizza and wings and you're creating a, a child with them of <laughs> chicken and waffle pizza. <laughs> yes, they are all my precious pizza baby. We love, we love. This pizza uses a blend of margarine and butter as a base on top of the olive oil. So this doesn't have a sauce on it, does it? No, it's just gonna be like the oil and the butter. Okay, the sick. olive oil is just gonna be like a sheen to protect the dough itself. And then the butter will kind of melt and create these little soup pools that'll be perfect for when we put our waffles on. And it'll just like soak up all that butter. Baby, baby is speaking my delicious. language. With our buttery base ready, Tara and I add boneless chicken wings and mozz cheese. Then it was time for something sweet. Our secret little ingredient, we're gonna add yes, some syrup before. Yes, look at this, it's so wrong, it's right. <laughs> so a little bit of a Just swirl. A swirl. So it kind of bakes into the base and stuff and almost like caramelizes on there. The pizza bakes at 555 degrees until the crust turns golden brown before the final topping. It's smelling so good in here. Smells like breakfast. breakfast. <laughs> Jinx. Oh, we can't Wait, forget the Mike's Hot The honey. most important part. Grizzle me timbers. Pizza time. Cheers. Cheers. So you get a combination of crunch and fluff with a little bit of that salty cheese. And, and then, then it's the, just hot. And then the hot honey. It's good. It slaps. <laughs> Of course, I couldn't leave Zaza's without trying the famous pickle pizza. I could see a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle eating this right now. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers with your hot slice of pizza. Oh my gosh. It's got that punchy vinegar pickle taste and the cheese mellows it out. I never knew that a pickle on a pizza would work so well. It does. I don't like pineapple on pizza, but like pickle on pizza, mm -hmm. that's my move. Before heading back to New York, I had one more pizza party to attend. My friend and owner of Zaza's Pizza Wings, Tara Hatton. Tara's routine wowed friends and fans of all ages who came to wish her well before the big competition. Yeah! 
taking it all the way back to where you first began in the kitchen with your mom and grandma <laughs> to where you are today. If they could see you now, what do you think they would say? I would like to say that they are definitely proud. I don't think they would expect what I'm doing now compared to where my like original game plan was in life. I think they would realize it's not just pizza to me. It is my life, it is my world, and I love it. <laughs>
I mean, librarian saved the world, and now with us is <laughs> Kathy Brockema, Sumas Elementary librarian. Kathy, I know what? looking at those images of your beloved library mm -hmm. broke your heart, but what did it feel like to have mm -hmm. all of these people come together mm -hmm. right afterwards to help you, including a complete stranger? Yeah. There were a lot of strangers that were there helping clean up, and the part that made me feel so grateful was they were giving up their time yeah. when their own homes were underwater waiting for their cleanup. That's incredible. They took care of the school before they took care of their own homes. I love the woman we featured in the piece. Her name was Jan and said Jen, she said Jen she Bromley. got, did you ever get a chance to say I've hey to her? I never met her and she's probably only 15 miles away. Well, she's actually closer than 15 miles away right now. Hey, Jen, you want to come say hello? <laughs> come on over. Yes. Hi, it's so nice Hi. to meet you. You made such a difference in our lives. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Oh my it was gosh. My pleasure. What a moment that was, Jen, when you said you were listening to worship, worship music driving along and then it just came to you. Yeah, I, I really think of that as a God thought, not a Jen thought. Yeah, like, I loved that beautiful yeah. sentence in that because it. it but you know what? <laughs> you can have a thought yeah. that feels like a God thought, yeah. and then there's action. Yeah. Yeah. What did your kids think when they knew they were helping <laughs> this incredible librarian and all these kids get the books they they deserve? Well, I'll, I'll tell you, I didn't think anything of it. I didn't. I, I felt like it was the right thing to do, and so I didn't tell the kids to start with oh. until Scholastic contacted me and they asked, what was the reaction of the kiddos? <laughs> and so then I, I told each class separately and most of them broke out in applause. Oh, uh, oh, one, uh, oh, one oh. student literally leaned forward in her seat and said, I, are we gonna help them? <laughs> oh. Are we gonna help them? Well, we have a couple of books for you. We sure do. Kathy, Kathy will you? this is for you, and will you just read it? Chicken Little and the Big Bad Wolf. <laughs> will you read the dedication on the first page? Mm -hmm. This book is dedicated to Kathy Bronkema, Sumas Elementary Librarian. As your school reopens in its brand new building, Scholastic would like to help fill your library shelf. I'll be donating $10,000 worth of books in addition to 10,000 scholastic dollars for your school community to use towards supplies and even more books. Um, oh my goodness. What do you think? What do you think? Oh my gosh. Thank you, Scholastic. <laughs> Jen? Oh. Yeah. We have a dedication for you, too. Would you I like love to this book, The Cat Kid uh, Comic Club. I know. I'm like, oh, it's the new one. Yes, it is. <laughs> the kids will be so excited about that. This book is dedicated to Jen Frombley, Bernice Bosbeck Elementary Librarian. In honor of the kindness you bestowed on your neighbors, Scholastic will also be donating $10,000 worth of books and $10,000 Scholastic dollars to your school community as well. Wow. Oh my God. <laughs> Thank you. Full circle. Oh my, oh my gosh, Kathy. books can change the world <laughs> they, they and librarians. Do. Do. Yes, do. indeed. Uh, Jenna's mom's a librarian, as you know, yes. and my mom's a librarian. Right. Worked at the Library of Congress for 30 uh, plus years. I mean, we love this librarians. Library. Library. Yeah. <laughs> well, we love you all. Thank you guys thank for you, coming to be with us. Congratulations, thank, thank too. Next up, we are spotlighting another very special librarian, fiercely devoted to her students, her community, and to share her love of reading. Before you even step foot inside of Horizons on the Hudson Magnet School in New Bern, New York. Hi guys! Bye bye! You know something special is happening within its walls and something magical in its library. What do you feel when you walk into your library? <sighs> love. Love. Michelle Wright Jump has been the school librarian for more than a decade. A job she calls a dream. I absolutely love what I do. I love my kids. It just makes my day, just knowing that I'm touching their lives and that we have a connection. The school is rich in diversity and culture, and for some, English is not their first language. With books in a dozen different languages, Mrs. Jump makes sure that her students feel valued and recognized in her library. What does it feel like when you recommend a book to a child and they feel seen? I think it affirms who they are when a kid comes in and they like the book that I recommend, oh my goodness, it is the best feeling in the world because I know that if that child's a reluctant reader, then I'm onto something. And it opens up so many worlds. It does, it does, like it did for me. 
An immigrant herself, Mrs. Jump grew up in Jamaica with no access to a school library. Her parents prioritized literacy for her and her siblings, but she admits it wasn't love at first sight. One holiday, you asked for a record player. We were into music. We wanted to sing Michael Jackson and Karen <laughs> Carpenter. And my parents brought us a set of encyclopedias. Encyclopedias, <laughs> we wanted a record player. But it transformed our lives. Our house became like a hub for research for the whole community. If reading is her first love, then her community is a close second. Mrs. Jump envisions her students making a difference in their hometown. My dream is that one day when I'm old and great, that I'll see them as president, as the business owner somewhere, making decisions in the community. And that's why we bring in community partners so that they can model for them. Last year, Mrs. Jump was named the New York Library Association's Librarian of the Year. But her students love her more for her heart than her fancy title. I think I met her like when I was in first grade. Then when I saw her, I was thinking in my head, oh my gosh, she's my favorite. After I met Miss Jump, she encouraged me and inspired me to read more. It's so cool how she likes to focus on each and every one of us to make us be better. Oh, that's so sweet. There's not much Mrs. Jump won't do for her kids. She embraces their cultures, even painting the flags of her students' homelands on her nails. How do they respond when they see their home country painted? <laughs> Sometimes they're distracted. <laughs> but again, they feel affirmed. They know that where they're from is important, who they are is important. They'll be validated here. Coming up, we'll visit a different kind of library where people are the open books, right after this. Boost. Our next story spotlights a program that gives new meaning to music education using reading, writing, and rap. It is the brainchild of two friends who see hip hop as a way to keep kids engaged, and it is working. We're gonna look through some music, y'all are gonna listen to it, you're gonna internalize it, we're gonna find words that we don't know, and we're gonna dig deep. At Houston's Fleming Middle School, before anyone cracks a book in Miss Rogers' reading class, rule number one is listen. I saw they was running, I said that I'm coming, just give me the torch, hey. The weight of this heavy don't matter, I'm ready, I do it for sport. While textbooks stay closed, the lesson's taught in a brand new way, verse by verse. You hear reading with a rapper the first time, as a teacher, <laughs> a little skeptical. Yeah, <laughs> it was a little like, oh my gosh, what is this going to look like? How is this going to, you know, impact the classroom? Like Kenya Rogers, one of the first teachers to feature the rap lessons in her classroom. Now she asks students to find similes, metaphors, and alliteration, not in novels, but hidden in the lyrics of hip hop. As an educator, it's amazing. Anytime the light bulb goes off for a student and you find something that actually works, that's going to help them learn and be better, you know, readers and writers, of course, that makes you excited. <laughs> the idea, called Reading with a Rapper, was created by two friends, Jaron Small and Douglas Johnson, who wanted to help schools connect with students by tailoring a curriculum to the audience. 
think a lot of times school at a certain point, it just wasn't fun. So I think it started from there. Like, how can we change the feeling of what school is for the next generation? The two-month program remixes traditional lesson plans by partnering with local rappers. Each song helping teach crucial concepts like sentence structure, grammar, and figurative language with a side of rap. Reading would have been significantly more fun, uh, I think. <laughs> right. and, and that's like the biggest thing that we hear all the time as we're going around to these different schools, whether it's parents or teachers. Or like, Man, I wish I had this when I was in school. Looking at the words that we don't know, make an inference. We're going to talk about what we don't know about these words. Nationwide, Texas literacy rates rank near the bottom, 46 out of 50. From poor test scores to a lack of comprehension, Experts say failure to grasp critical language skills early on can lead to a lifetime of limited opportunities. And it's the foundation root of learning as human beings. You can't do anything without If you me. can't read and write, you can't do STEM. I can't give you financial literacy. I can't give you any derivative because you just simply can't understand it. Helping tackle the root of the problem, the program's first signed artist, Buddy Rowe. The torch is taking the information from the last generation and carving your own path. It's not a designation, but a destination. The Houston area native dropped out of high school to chase a rap career, but found himself looking for more than parties and fame. I wanted to have personal experiences with the people that are consuming my music. It's never been just about the music for you. No, uh-uh. I don't think I would have continued to do it if it was just about the music, if it wasn't about helping people or impacting people. His biggest fans these days, filling more classrooms than clubs, all learning from the lyrics he pours his heart and soul into, like students Jayla Lewis and Mel Jennings. You can learn anything, but like in a different way. Like that's what reading with a rapper have taught me. Like it just don't have to be a text you can learn from. You can learn it from an artist and how they write their music. I, I learned about myself that I learned reading faster when I listen to music. The impact already couldn't be more clear. The program says it's helped 100,000 students, has expanded to seven states, and has big dreams to go international. Music to these founders' ears. We see that if we make a school better, we make a community better. And if we make a community better, we're making a city better. If we can make our cities better, then we can make our country better. So for us, yeah, it, it is education, but ultimately it's like, how do we just make the human race just better? You won't find the next summer page turner at this library, but you will hear a great story at the Human Library, where it's not about books, but people on loan. They're all volunteers from diverse backgrounds, and each one has a story to share. NBC's Matt Bradley has that story. You've probably been told never to judge a book by its cover, but at the Human Library, it's the human experience that's on loan, and judging the books is part of the experience. What do you call your book? Uh, I'm the gay book in the Human Library. Ben is also an open book. That's the idea. The Human Library lets quote-unquote readers check out human books, people, instead of paper. What is it exactly? Describe the like actual dynamics here. You're greeted by a very nice librarian that's going to help you understand what the opportunity is all about. It's going to introduce you to our rules, which are very simple. We want the books back on time in the same condition. You can't take them home. And you have 30 minutes to sit down and ask any question you want about being bipolar or transgender or refugee or Muslim or a police officer or a politician or growing up in the U.S. with an African-American background. What happens next is a kind of choose your own adventure that probably sounds a lot like a conversation. Except here, there's no such thing as a stupid question. So just being in conversation with somebody that they've never had the opportunity to talk to, it is inevitably transformative. It changes people's minds, it changes people's lives. It all started more than 20 years ago in Denmark, the brainchild of Ronnie Abergel. When you talk about this, this idea, this germ of an idea, where did it come from? My idea was to put unpopular people on low, to sort of say, hey, what if we put together some of the people that we're always kind of talking about behind their back or have an opinion on, but we really never sit down and take the time and get to know them. Since 2000, human libraries have popped up across the globe, including in the U.S., lending out candid conversations just as tolerance is starting to look way overdue. And we've stopped engaging with the people we think we disagree with 
I think that's the dangerous part of what's happening uh, to my fellow uh, people over there, is that we've stopped you know, seeking that dialogue. The novel idea, challenging prejudice, one story at a time. If you choose to, you can do things to improve your life. It might sound like preaching to the choir. After all, everyone involved is a volunteer, but Habergel's libraries are mobile, bringing his books into institutions and companies. We're reaching people beyond the congregation, no doubt about it. Uh, we're going into industries that have the, they have an image of being pale, male, and stale. But when we engage with them, they're really vibrant and energetic and open and ready to change. The libraries create a safe space with the hope of turning fear into friendship and simply showing the power of sharing stories. What society doesn't have groups that are exposed to stigma and stereotype? So we're not saying don't judge. Actually, we're saying come and unjudge. Well, now you're about to meet an eight-year-old boy with the right stuff. He authored and illustrated his very own book. And with the help of local librarians, it can now be found on the library shelf. There's even a wait list. Libraries are designed for checking books out. But eight-year-old Dylan Helbig recently proved you can check one in. They thought I was kidding, but I wasn't. He recently wrote his own book, filling an empty journal with 81 pages of words and illustrations featuring an exploding Christmas tree and a giant turkey. It's called The Adventures of Dylan Helbig's Christmas by Dylan Helbig himself. That's right, by Dylan himself. The story so good he felt it belonged on the shelves of the Ada Community Library in Idaho. So, ever so discreetly, he took the initiative. And then I came in this aisle. No, wait, this aisle. And then I put my book right here. What were you afraid of? The librarian catching me. Were you afraid you might have been in trouble? I, I haven't really thought about that part. <laughs> we didn't think about that consequence of that part yet. <laughs> when the librarians did find out, well, they threw some stickers on it and made it available to check out. My first reaction was, what? <laughs> really? You know, is that possible? Like, you can do that? You can do that? <laughs> at last check, the wait list for Dylan's book was at 64, motivating the young author to get going on a sequel. And it's called The Jacket Eating Closet, based on actual events. A budding publishing empire thanks to a sneaky plan by Dylan himself. <laughs> Boost, the Milwaukee Public Library is home to more than two and a half million books, but it is their TikTok videos writing their next chapter. 
They are pop culture inspired from employees and they're racking up millions of views. From the outside, the Milwaukee Public Library might remind you of a bygone era. Built in the 1800s, the majestic building is home to more than 2.5 million books. But it's their TikTok videos that are writing their next chapter. Incredible videos made by employees to help catapult their library into the modern age. We thought that it would be a new way to engage a new audience. Immediately, the videos were a hit. In our first month, I think we had 5 million views. In the first month, you had 5 million views? Yeah. Uh, how'd you do that? Um, I don't know. There, we, we make good videos, I guess. Ready. Great videos, in fact, shot and edited on an iPhone by library data analyst Derek Riley. It's Wait, obviously. let me stop you. You said free. You guys aren't spending any money on this? No. Not a dime. We don't even have dedicated staff members. Every single person that works on TikTok has another full-time job at the library. Like Evans Mikowski, the library's accountant. You're like this. And Fawn Simpson fuchs a library volunteer coordinator. For Fawn, it's a bit of a family affair. So not only are you working on these videos and appeared in these videos, your daughter's in the videos. Right. Uh, my dogs are also in the videos. Your dogs do? Yeah. So everybody. <laughs> yes. Is there, any, is there anything off limits? Right. No, probably not. It's opening the whole anything life. Anything for the library. Ready. Pitching, planning, and producing the videos is no small feat. But the response is the reward when they get to read the touching comments that roll in. The public libraries were my safe place growing up in Milwaukee. Thank you for being there for me. Another commenter said, this made me cry thinking about my small rural town librarian handing me the books about being gay after I rode my bike there when I was 13. Thank you. What's it like to get that feedback? Teared up reading the comments on that video. Um, we get a lot of great comments. People saying they want to fly to Milwaukee just to visit our library. They want to move here. They want to work at this library. The video made them want to be a librarian. It made them sign up for a library card. More than 80 videos later, the once imposing building feels welcoming, inviting you behind the scenes, transforming the halls into a roller rink, and they're taking their popularity in stride. Let's see what she can do to minimize the press. I mean, I'm not joking. You have become recognizable in Milwaukee because of the work you've done at the library. You could absolutely say that. How does it feel? It feels incredible. It's, it's wonderful being able to walk down the street and you know people will call me out and people will say, hey, I've seen you on TikTok before. It's a pleasure being able to talk to them then about what we do at the library. Attention that couldn't come at a better time. Were you guys worried about what life would look like at the library after the pandemic if people would actually come back through these doors? Absolutely, mm -hmm. and we continue to be worried about it. We have not reached the numbers of patrons entering buildings or checking materials out that we had in 2019. Still. We're far from it. Library funding across the country is in danger. Nationally, visits to libraries are down, and fewer books are being checked out, though registered digital users are on the rise. With that in mind, Milwaukee's library is using their newfound fame to give old books a new cover. I think that's one way though that TikTok has helped us because we are able to highlight those library resources that you don't even need to leave your house for. The latest trend in cyberspace, online traffic driving readers back to the printed world. Coming up, need a smile? Do not miss the latest viral video we have to share for you right after this.
after the boost, we have one more video that will brighten your day. Take a look. It was a big day for a Toronto teen and his family. They sat down at the computer to find out which colleges Tanaya was accepted to. We're talking about some of the best schools in the United States. Mm. We're talking about Yale, Dartmouth. Okay, at first things were not going well. A couple of rejections, a couple of wait lists, until finally his dream came true. I'm waitlisted at, at Princeton. Princeton. Waitlisted. Oh, there we go. Oh! <laughs> 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 Where? What are you going to do? He got into Harvard. Oh. Okay. That was like my reaction. Harvard. <laughs> we don't know who was more excited, Tanaya or his family. By the way, <laughs> Tanaya also got accepted into Brown and Penn. Oh, oh wow. So he's got some tough choices to make. Man. But how about a wait list? That is oh. right. And then a Harvard, yes. And he's worked at Harvard. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Very cool. We hope we were able to start your day off with a little positivity. We want to see you right here tomorrow with more of The Boost on Today All Day. I'm Shop Today Editorial Director Adriana Brock, and I know shopping trends. I seek out new and notable products so you don't have to in editor's picks. I'm fashion and beauty expert Makon Jovu, and I'm bringing you industry insiders and those in the know to share all the buzzworthy products sweeping social media in influencer trends. And I'm Shop All Day contributor Chassie Post. Each week, I'm here with the must have fashion and beauty products at a price you'll like in Style Finder. This is Shop All Day, the great outdoors. Hey everyone, I'm Adriana Brock and we are back today with another episode of Shop All Day. Summer is heating up and whether you're headed to hike, surf, or just lay on the beach, I've got everything you need to enjoy the great outdoors. From lanterns that are gonna take your trip from camping to glamping, to a car adapter that will keep the kids entertained for the entire road trip. I cannot wait to get started. And remember, see that QR code at the corner of your screen? You can use the camera on your smartphone to scan it for instant access to all the products on the show today. Or you can text SHOP to the number below to shop all the products we're sharing with you today. Okay, so no one likes mosquito bites or smelly repellent spray, so this first pick is a game changer for those days outside in the summer. According to the brand, they are deep free mosquito repellent patches. They are peel and stick patches that are made with plant-based ingredients like citronella and peppermint essential oils, and they're waterproof. The brand said they repel mosquitoes for three feet for up to six to eight hours, so you can spend more time outside. The brand also says that they're pediatrician approved and safe enough for kids to use. All you have to do is peel one of these stickers and you can put it on your shirt or even your bag to stay protected all day long. I am so excited for summer road trips. And if you are gonna have a car full just like mine, this little car gadget is gonna come in handy when everyone's electronics need a charge on the go. The car power inverter has two AC 110 volt outlets and four USB port chargers. And it's so compact and lightweight, so you can charge all of the family's essentials like laptops, tablets, and cell phones. All right, and whether you are camping or hitting the beach, this next one is a two-in-one gadget you're gonna love. It is a lantern and a phone charger that actually folds down flat and then pops up when you need to use it as a lantern. It has a small solar panel so you can recharge it in a pinch when you're out in the sun. But when it's blown up, it's so lightweight that even the kids can use it. And according to the brand, it's 100% waterproof. And in the dark, this is what it looks like. Okay, this next one you guys have to see to believe. It is an inflatable couch air lounger that provides portable lounging wherever your outdoor adventure takes you. Did I mention you don't even need a pump to blow it up? You guys have to see this. It only takes a few minutes and all you have to do is take it out of this cool little carrying case that it comes with, unclip it, and then whisk it through the air to inflate it. The trick though is to trap air by closing the sleeve opening little by little. So once it's blown up, according to the brand, it stays that way for up to five or six hours. Plus, it has a pillow-shaped headrest, so you get support from head to toe. And yes, I've tried it, and I actually think it's pretty comfortable. Another summer-friendly must-have is a pair of lightweight, waterproof sneakers. From cruises to beach trips, 
These are a versatile sneaker that you're gonna wanna wear if you're outdoors near some water. These are great because the brand says that these have an anti-slip outsole with a strong track adhesion. So when you're wet, they're comfortable and you can wear these as walking shoes as well. Because according to the brand, they dry pretty quickly. Okay, so this umbrella is one of those finds I didn't know I needed until I found it. It is called the Sportbrella and it is a clamp-on shade canopy that provides shade wherever you need it. It has a unique heavy duty universal clamp that you can use on square and tube shaped surfaces. So what does that mean? You can clamp it on anything from a beach chair to a golf bag and even benches. It's also really unique because it has a 360 degree swivel, two button hinges, so you can get shade wherever you need it. And if that wasn't enough, this umbrella, according to the brand, it's made with a UPF 50 material that's gonna provide some serious sun protection. All right, and from fashion to backyard fun, I bet you've been wondering why there's a huge rainbow behind me. Well, this rainbow arc will make your home the place to be this summer. It's a large inflatable sprinkler that all the kids in the neighborhood are absolutely gonna love. And you don't need a huge yard to get in on the fun. It's about four and a half feet tall and five and a half feet wide. So it's perfect for the kids to have fun in the sun without the need to drive to the pool or the beach. Let's run through the products one more time. The Evolve Together Mosquito Repellent Patches, the Car Power Inverter, the Luminate Solar Lantern, the Wikapo Inflatable Lounger, the Quick Drying Water Shoes, the Sportbrella, and the H for Happy Gigantic Rainbow Sprinkler. And just so you know, today works with affiliate partners and earns a commission on purchases made through our links at today.com. And that is it for our editor's picks. Up next, Mako Logu is talking to dermatologist, Dr. Angela Lamb, who is sharing her favorite skincare products to protect your skin in the great outdoors. Plus, she'll spice up your outdoor adventures with some makeup products to keep you looking fresh all day long. Don't go away. Hi there, welcome back. 
I'm Makon Jovu, and this is Influencer Trends, where I'll be talking to industry insiders, and they'll share their favorite products and the must-have items to shop for right now. And don't forget the QR code on the corner of your screen. Use the camera on your smartphone and scan it to shop these products. The warm weather is upon us, and people everywhere are looking to soak up some sun. Now, if you want to update your beauty routine for the warm weather, boy, do I have products that are just right for you. Whether you're planning a day trip or a road trip, most of us are looking to protect our skin while also looking for that grand adventure. So I brought in expert dermatologist Dr. Angela Lamb to share her favorite buzzworthy products for the great outdoors. Dr. Lamb, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. All right, so when it comes to being outdoors, what are some top essentials for staying safe in the sun? The main essentials for staying safe in the sun are sunscreen, 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 and sun avoidance. So you don't want to be in the sun between the hours of usually 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. They say if your shadow is actually shorter than you, mm -hmm. that means the sun is really too high. Oh. Yeah. Also, also if you um, are out, you want to wear sun protective clothing. You want to do broad brim hats. Mm -hmm. You want to wear long sleeve clothing. Actually, a lot of clothing has SPF in it now. So those are really some of the mainstays to staying safe in the sun. That's good to know. I'm going to spread that to my entire family. I did not know that. Now, we all go to the dentist and we go see our family doctor, mm -hmm. but how often should we be going to see our dermatologist? Most people should check in with their dermatologist yearly. Um, sometimes it depends on your risk factors. So if you have lighter skin, if you spent more time in the sun, if you've had a lot of blistering sunburns, you might want to go every six to nine months. Oh. But most folks, especially over about the age of 30, need to check in yearly. Yearly. Okay, good to know. I'm going to add that to my calendar. All right, let's get into some of these picks. I'm so excited about everything you brought. Let's start with the first one. So this sunscreen, I'm fascinated. The fact that it's like an oily substance. Tell me about it. So what I love about this Melee sunscreen is that it's actually an oil base. It doesn't have mineral oil, but it's clear, it's sheer. You can put it on, you can put it on under makeup, um, and it really provides that great SPF. And as you apply it, you see how it has a sheen, yeah. but it creates good moisture without leaving any white cast. That's some of the biggest feedback I get from patients yeah. about sunscreen, is they don't like that white chalky feel. And this, look at how great that just blends into your skin. I mean. um, you get the moisture, you get that glow. Um, without clogging your pores. That's what I love about it. It's so beautiful. I love this sheen. I'm obsessed with yeah. that already. Now, can everybody use this? I know it's maybe for black and brown people. Melee is a brand that actually was formulated for melanin-rich skin, but yeah. I like people to know that this is great for any skin type. All right, let's move on to the next product here. I love that this mineral sunscreen has no cast as well. What mm -hmm. other benefits does this mm -hmm. one have? So what's great about this Bliss Sunblock is that it is mineral-based. So the key with mineral-based, there's pretty much two different types of sunblock you can have. A chemical-based sunscreen or sunblock or a mineral-based one. This one is fully mineral-based, which is good for the coral reef. All of those types of things, patients ask me about that a lot. They want to make sure that the sunblocks are good for the environment. Mm -hmm. But what's great about this one is the way they've processed it, like you said, no cast either. So if you try that one on, yeah. um, you're not going to have that white cast. It's good for all skin types. It also has an ingredient in it that actually absorbs oil and actually makes your pores look smaller. Yeah. Um, so that's like a two for one. That's a win-win yeah. situation. Mm -hmm. Now there's a misconception. Can we talk about this elephant in the room that yeah. black and brown folks don't have to oh, wear no. sunscreen? <laughs> we have to wear sunscreen if we're having those grand adventures Absolutely. outdoors, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, even though skin that's darker does have some built-in SPF protection, that doesn't mean that we don't need extra. So it's only about SPF 13 you get when you have darker skin. So this, for example, is SPF 30. You need that extra sunblock and that's what's going to prevent us from looking old faster. So that's really the key. Dr. Lamb, thank you for clearing that up. And by the way, you may have earned a commission on a Bliss products on your site. Let's move on to this eyeshadow stick. I want to look fresh when I'm out there in the great outdoors. Tell me about this one. All right, so what's nice about this, you put it on um, and in a little bit of time it sets and you can get in the water and you can be out there. Nobody wants to be in the sun or exercising or sweating and having their makeup running all over their face. So this one is great. It really has staying power. Mm -hmm. um, and like you said, people want to look glam when they're on the beach, out in the sun. And so this is really formulated exactly for those purposes. But look at the color payoff as well. I know, they have a broad range of colors. Yeah. So you don't have to sacrifice 
sacrifice beauty for convenience and safety, so that's important. <laughs> I love how small and portable it is. Yeah. All right, let's move on to other makeup products as mm -hmm. well. When it comes to applying makeup for the great outdoors, right, it's sometimes you wonder, is it light and breathable? Is this one light and breathable? So this MAC foundation is light and breathable. I mean, a lot of people know MAC for their staying power, their ability to hold up under lights, camera, action. Yeah. Um, but this one also holds up in the water, which is really fantastic. Um, and it is breathable, is light, and again, also, you're not gonna find it all over your shirt mm -hmm. um, because it sets as well. Look at how it is just melting into my skin. Absolutely love this one. So Dr. Lamb, I have a confession. Mm -hmm. I've actually never used self-tanner before. <laughs> how does this work? All right, so the way self-tanner works is you apply it, there's a chemical compound in there, and if you apply it day after day, particularly this one, which gives you that gradual glow. So after about five to seven days, you're gonna get some increased pigment, um, a nice glow. As a dermatologist, we always say the only safe tan is from a bottle, okay? <laughs> okay? So that's the only kind of tan I ever want anybody of any skin type to get. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, this is gradual, so you're not gonna have those streaks that you sometimes can get with some sunless tanners, and it'll just give you that nice, ready to be out in the sun, but again, safely tan. I love this, and I love how also that anyone can use this, mm -hmm. right, because I just put it on my hands, and I love how it just blends right in seamlessly, too. Mm -hmm. oh. That's the key for so many of these products. We don't want to have you do a lot of work. We want it to be a seamless and have you able to enjoy the sun in the summer. I can't wait for that. All right, so sunburn is one of just the most annoying <laughs> things ever, right, that you can experience. How does this product here from Clarence help to soothe the skin? Yes, so first, I mean, for me, a dermatologist, that's like sacrilege. I never want to have somebody come in and say that they got a burn. But if you did, ideally you will have used some of these first two products to avoid that. But if you do, um, you want something that's gonna be soothing, cooling. This product has a lot of aloe in it. So aloe has a very high water content, um, which is gonna be soothing for you. And one little trick I say is to put that in the refrigerator before you apply it. So when it's actually physically cool, that helps as well. Okay, so do you use this before you get the sunburn or you use it after? No, technically you're supposed to use it after. It's okay. actually called after sun. But again, hopefully you've done the right things. You've applied your sunblock. You wanna always apply it about 20 minutes before you go outside. You've mm -hmm. worn your hat, you've avoided the sun. It smells great as well. Mm -hmm. Dr. Lamb, I love all your selections. I am ready to get out there and just be out there on my great adventure. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Oh yeah, our pleasure. Now let's run through all the products one more time. We have the Melee No Shade Sunscreen Oil, the Bliss Black Star Sunscreen, the Cargo Cosmetics Swimmables Cream Eyeshadow Stick, the MAC Studio Radiance Face and Body Radiant Sheer Foundation, the Jurgens Natural Glow self tanning Moisturizer, and the Clarins SOS Sunburn Soother Mask. And just so you know, today works with affiliate partners and earns a commission on purchases made through our links at today.com. Up next, you'll never believe what's in style this summer. Chassis Post is here with the hottest trends for the great outdoors, like the chic fanny pack that's making a comeback. Don't go away.
everyone. Welcome back. I'm Shop All Day contributor Chassie Post, and today we've been talking about hitting the roads or trails and taking in the great outdoors. And I can't wait to show you the trends that will have you looking your best while enjoying some fun in the sun. And remember, see that QR code in the corner of your screen. You can use the camera on your smartphone to scan it for instant access to the products on the show today. So let's get to it. So let's start off with the cutest matching jacket and short set from Old Navy that is the definition of sporty chic. I love it when brands take functional high-tech performance wear and make it fashion. So let's first talk about the jacket. It's an easy, lightweight, half-zip pullover with a drawstring hood. And check out the color blocking. Such a big trend. I am obsessed with these fun, punchy oranges. So cute. And if you're more of a monochromatic gal, it also comes in a solid black. But also, I am a huge fan of this silhouette. It is so easy to wear. I mean, slightly oversized with that on-trend crop that hits right at the waist, which I think makes it look really flattering. And it even has a drawstring hem. And this fabric, it's fabulous. It's called Stretch Tech. And just like the name suggests, it's got a great stretch to it. And the brand says that it's also breathable with quick drying powers and UV sun protection built right in. But that's just the jacket. Let's complete the set with the shorts. I mean, they're made out of the same stretch tech fabric, but they have an additional feature. Old Navy says that they're also water repellent. And the cut of these shorts is so flattering. They're high-waisted and they've got a really nice, generous wide leg opening. And both of those features combined make your legs look really great and elongated. These shorts also have room for all your stuff, loads of pocket, and there's even one hidden stash zip pocket that can hold your phone. But if you're not a matching set fan, no worries. These two pieces also work great as separates to mix and match with the rest of your closet and come in tons of summer colors in sizes ranging from extra small to 4X. So we're gonna look great out there this summer. <laughs> Workout or weekend, we've got you covered with this sporty set. Next, one of my absolute favorite sporty must-haves and one of the summer's biggest trends, the exercise dress. And just like the yoga pant, you don't actually have to be exercising to wear it. So whether you're running around town doing errands, heading to the gym, or hitting the tennis court or golf course, the exercise dress is going to keep you looking and feeling cool. Now, I've actually got three of these very same dresses and they make a really great warm weather uniform. And I'm not alone. We've seen it all over social media. And once you try one, you'll see what everybody's so excited about. I mean, first of all, it's got the best of two worlds. You've got this easy A-line dress, which is inspired by tennis core slash all things tennis style, which is a huge trend right now, combined with the practicality and relative modesty of a skirt. See right under the skirt? You've got biking shorts with two pockets. It's almost like shapewear. And this one's from Amazon and is a really great example of the trend. So next, we've got two versatile pairs of performance pants that you are going to love for all of your outdoor activities this summer. So first up, meet the Climatrail zip-off pant. Now this pan is by Eddie Bauer and it's genius and perfect for those days where it starts out cool and gets warmer as the day goes on. And here's how they work. They start out as a full length pant and then as the temps rise, you can just zip off the bottoms and you got a pair of shorts. And how cool is that? And check out this fabric. The brand says it's made out of a four way stretch that's also water repellent and has UPF 50 plus sun protection. And did we mention that they were also flattering? We give a thumbs up to the mid-rise silhouette. We've also got another equally versatile outdoor pant from Amazon that is a number one bestseller. These easy to wear joggers are also made out of a performance fabric that the brand says is lightweight, quick dry, and water resistant and shoppers rave about how comfortable these pants are. According to the brand, the fabric has 8% spandex and it's got an easy elastic waistband with a little drawstring so you can adjust the fit. 
and check out all these pockets. You've got two side zip, two cargo, and one back zip pocket. So no wonder they're so popular. And yes, these pants are perfect for outdoor adventures, hiking, working out, walking, you name it. But they also make excellent travel and lounge pants. Now, if you've been looking for an easy and stylish way to protect yourself from the sun-strong UV rays this summer, then you're going to love these multitasking swim tees from Land's End. They're designed to just wear over your swimsuit top. And according to Land's End, they're made out of a moisture-wicking stretch fabric that keeps you dry and comfortable on land. The brand says, besides providing more coverage from the sun than a typical bathing suit, that they also offer UPF 50 protection, which really comes in handy if you spend a lot of time at the pool or the beach. Plus, I am loving their surfer chic vibe. I mean, look at these stripes here. That's where rash guards actually got their start, protecting surfers from rough boards. And now they've gone mainstream, protecting us all from the sun. And I'm really into the classic crew neck style. And you can choose from either short sleeves or long sleeves and they come in so many vibrant colors and patterns. And the best part, they're not just for swimming. They also work as a colorful cover-up. Moving on to New England chic, meet the Marley Lily monogrammed Nantucket cover-up. And she is cute. We all need a great cover-up and we could not be more obsessed with this one. Yes, we love the loose fitting, flattering V-neck silhouette. The easy butterfly sleeves and the classic seersucker print fabric. But let's be honest, this cover up had us at the word monogram. See right here on the hem? You can choose from several monogram styles and three pretty colorways the blue seersucker, we've got the pink seersucker, and we've also got a mint seersucker. Plus, Talk about beach to brunch and beyond. You can throw on this fabulous cover up over your suit, add a pair of gold hoop sandals, and you are ready for dinner. Just like that. And if you really want to do it up, they even make a matching monogram straw hat in my favorite surfer style. Talk about fun in the sun. Next, don't get me started on my love of fanny pack slash belt bags, or in this case, the bum bag, because I really, really love them. And there's a reason that this 90s style is back in such a big way. They're just so incredibly useful. Now, this is the Moonbeam bum bag, and I am a huge fan of anything that allows me to go hands-free. And I have to tell you guys, I wear my fanny pack every single day. And in my humble opinion, this sporty style is the ultimate in hands-free utilitarian style. Now we found these adorable takes at Madewell. They're designed by a Los Angeles-based brand called Lola, known for their stylish carryalls inspired by California beach life. Now they've got a classic half moon shape, thus the name, and you can wear them around your waist, a la the classic bum bag, or you can wear them over your shoulder as a crossbody, and it's the perfect size for your on-the-go essentials. This new collection is designed from recycled nylon with cool details like a chunky zipper, and I love the bold candy colors. And of course, one of this bag's finest virtues is its versatility. With that hands-free storage, this is the bag you want coming along for the ride. Whether you're headed on an outdoor adventure, to a fun barbecue, or to the grocery store. And last but not least, put your hands together for one of my favorite summer innovations, the ponytail hat. This hat just might be my favorite summer accessory ever. It's genius and hysterical, and I've seen the ponytail baseball hat before, but never the ponytail sun hat. Thank goodness someone came along and designed a hat that doesn't make me choose between my beloved high pony and sun protection. And let's face it, getting your hair off your neck feels a whole lot cooler when it's scorching hot out there. This hat also has a lot of bells and whistles. It's got a good wide brim, three and a half inches, breathable mesh sides, and both the hat and the chin strap are adjustable. Plus, the brand says that it's waterproof quick drying, and even has a built-in sweatband. 
It's also packable, so you can fold it up and throw it in your bag and go. Plus, it comes in over 16 different colors. Yes, this is a hat that both you and your ponytail are gonna love. Okay, so let's run through these products one more time. We've got the Old Navy Color Block Jacket and Shorts, the Amazon Sleepless Workout Dress, the Eddie Bauer Zip Off Pants, the Libin Cargo Joggers, we've got the Lands End Rash Guards, the Marley Lily Monogram Hat and Cover Up, the Madewell Lola Bum Bag, and the Ponytail Sun Hat. And that's a wrap on Style Finder and for our show. It's been fun showing you our favorites, so tune in for an all new episode of Shop All Day. Joining us this morning, Chef Elena Besser. She is going to make something awesome as we get back to the routine looking for those easy and affordable weeknight dinner ideas. And to cook along with us, just scan that QR code. You can order the ingredients with one click, add them to your cart, and schedule pickup or delivery. Elena, good morning. Good morning, my sous chef. How are is, you today? I am well, thank you. Good. For putting me right in my place. Absolutely. I love it. Are you ready to get to chow? I, I like a woman who's ready to go. Let's do it. Let's do it. Okay. Let me know how to do How did you pick this? As an easy meal. Okay, so zucchini is in season right now, yep. therefore it's going to taste so much more delicious than it otherwise would, and it's going to be more affordable because we have a lot of zucchini available. So I figured, okay. let's take zucchini and let's turn it into a luscious, creamy sauce that doesn't have any added now, I said to you jokingly backstage, I said, why, did you, why do you cut the zucchini in this particular size? Why are they so small? And you actually had a great answer for that. There's a reason for it. Yes, there is a reason for it. So the reason why is because the smaller you cut the zucchini, the faster it's going to cook. And listen, we're trying to get food on the table as quickly as we right. can. We're busy people, so we want to make sure that we cut it into smaller pieces. These are about a quarter of an inch thick. We're going to add those dice pieces to a sheet tray, half of them, mm -hmm. and then we're going to take the other half and put them into a bowl. So these just get a nice drizzle of olive oil and mm -hmm. we're going to hit them with a little bit of salt to awaken that flavor. Yep. The higher you go when you season, the more surface area oh, that's you a thing. coverage you All get. Right. Highly recommend. Look so that. Yeah. Yeah. Sprinkle, make it rain. And then the next thing we're going to do is we're going to take some garlic cloves and we're quartering them. So here's the thing. You could smash them if you want, but I know a lot of people get intimidated by that action. So I figured let's just quarter Quartering. them put them right into our bowl, and then we're going to add it with some sauteed onions. And this is going to go at about a medium-high heat mm -hmm. uh, until that zucchini is nice and softened. You're gonna wanna give it a cover so you get that How long is that roughly, like 10 bottom. minutes? Yeah, about 10 minutes. Yeah. You get the caramelization from the bottom, but at the same time, it's softening the zucchini, and we are left I like where this is headed. This I can do everything you've done mixture. so far. It's oh, not out of my reach. Really yeah. Okay, and another thing that maybe also isn't out of your reach for me personally white wine. as well, white wine my yep. friend. So to add even more depth of flavor and to pick up any of those brown bits that we get on the bottom, um, also known as the fond, we are going to continue cooking that. It's going to infuse with flavor and we want to cook it at that medium high heat until it reduces down. It's delicious is and luxurious. Is this the sauce? Are you making the sauce? Or is this, this is just the like, sauce okay, that we're making while well, those are roasting How's the in the sauce oven. Taste? This, this is delicious. amazing. It tastes like, like it? creamy. It does. Doesn't it taste like no it cream. No, no cream at all. It's wow. just so creamy and silky. So the and reason why. After you cook it, you blend it? After you cook it, you blend it. And Al, you make a great point. The reason why we're getting that nice brightness is because once we have transferred that reduced uh, situation that we got over here to a blender, we're adding in the zest of a lemon. That gives us our brightness. Mm -hmm. And then we are also adding in some fresh basil. Mm -hmm. You know what I like that's not in here? I'm glad what? it's not as eggplant, because I like zucchini, but I don't like oh, eggplant. Oh, well, there you go. Good. I'm happy we didn't use that's eggplant right. then. So good. And then it's a so little bit of our cream. pasta water, and that gives us even more creaminess oh. and even more of a starchy component. That's, that's probably so where it's coming from, you got the it? pasta oh, water. Yeah. How's yeah. it going yeah. over there? Oh, good. No, I'm just about, we only had about two okay, minutes great. left, so I'm going to take my shot here. And then we're going to take our pasta. You can use any noodle that you want. This is as the Today Show team made sure I pronounced properly, Pockery. Pockery. We have our oh. Italian, so we want to make sure we're doing it properly. Oh, Shout no. out to like Anthony and Katie. And we are adding that directly into mm -hmm. this gorgeous blended sauce. By the way, can I just say for school nights, if we were making this in the daily household, we might 
do this sand sauce and just do it with a little butter and cheese for the kids. So yes, good. delicious. And then, and then hype and it up for the adults. Exactly. Can you use a different pasta? You could use any pasta you want. You could use this rigatoni. Really I love, you could use penne. I like fusilli. something that has a tube. Yes, fusilli. That would catch mm. the sauce beautifully. Great suggestion. Wow, that's We're right. going to finish mm -hmm. it up with a little bit of that fresh lemon juice from the lemon, lemon that we juice. have reserved that's over it. here. And you can add a little pasta water as you go to get it to a nice, luxurious consistency. And last but certainly not least, we are going to top it with no some giant pads of butter. No what is that? What are you no, on but top? it feels like it is. It's it crazy. Like we are adding pistachio. some pistachios, oh, pistachios. Oh, pistachios. Ooh, some Sicilian like pistachios. Oh, We've got some fresh basil, oh, yeah. that roasted zucchini. So we get those crispy bits. We get really zucchini good. two ways. Yeah. Dinner like this. Yeah. We're starting off with some gorgeous thick cut bacon. Boom. Anytime there's bacon in a recipe, I'm yes. a happy gal. I'm so happy. we are just going to slice this bacon on up. We're actually making a sweet corn mac and cheese for everyone that's wondering uh. um, and what I like to do whenever I'm cutting like pancetta or bacon or whatever I'll put uh. it in the fridge or the freezer right. before slicing it mm. so it just makes it easier a little thick, to cook. I actually started exactly. using scissors. Really? <laughs> that is also yes. a yes. great tip. Because I, I sometimes can't get the knife through because it's so fatty. Right? But. Exactly. Scissors they'll get the job done. Mm -hmm. Also great for cutting up herbs for garnish. Uh -huh. yeah. Good point. Okay so, so we're going to render this. We want to make sure that this is cooking at like a medium low heat. We mm -hmm. don't want it to be too high because it could cause the bacon to burn and stay a little chewy. We want it to be really crisp and delicious. Right. So this, what's in season right now, we corn. got a lot of corn. <laughs> yes. And it is so delicious. It's so sweet. And it actually has a lot of great starch in it. So we, and that's going to allow us to get a really creamy sauce mm -hmm. without creating a bechamel base, which is oh. traditional of a mac and cheese. Right. So we are putting it with the bottom down right into the bowl mm -hmm. and slicing it off of the cob. Okay. And you can keep that cob uh, for later, which I will show you what we're going to do with the cob oh. as well. well. Some people make uh, a stock out of it. That's yeah. Nice. Exactly. You can make a stock out of the cobs. Yeah. Al, you always know what's up in the kitchen. Yeah. I respect that. About I don't know you. much else. Okay. <laughs> so we have cut off that corn. Mm -hmm. And then what we're going to do is we are going to take that residual bacon fat that yeah. we have. That adds that flavor. Liquid gold, baby. Exact. You know it. And we're going to take some shallots that we just grated mm -hmm. on a box grater. We're going to mix those up. If you didn't have shallots, could you use onion? Yeah, absolutely. You could uh, use onion. You could use leek. You could add a little extra good. garlic if you want. Mm -hmm. And then a little chili flake for some some heat. This okay. you can keep out if you want as well. You know, if you're sensitive to heat, don't worry about right. it. And then, of course, once that's sauteed down, we add that corn in and saute it up. Hit it with a little bit of salt and pepper. Mm -hmm. Your kitchen at this point is going to be smelling amazing. It smells great already. And then we will take that mixture All and that. transfer it into a blender. Oh. So this blender, uh, it just has the mixture along with our pasta water, which mm -hmm. is another liquid gold. I call right. this unicorn juice because it has this. <laughs> magical thing where it creates a really nice starchy component which will coat that pasta mm -hmm. and give us a luxurious oh. thick sauce. And I noticed you have some Parmesan. Is that yes. Too? Oh, you know it. Okay. So you can use pecorino or parm. Pecorino will give you a little bit of a saltier experience. Mm -hmm. um, but if you can only find parm, that works too. And we are now making our sauce. So at a low heat oh. or even off the heat, depending on how hot your pan already is, you're going to transfer back back and forth between our cheese, a little uh -huh. bit of pasta mm -hmm. water, and then we're going to add in my good pal cheddar. Uh, yeah. It's <laughs> always better it. with cheddar. It's always better with cheddar. You know it. So we're adding a little bit at a time and continuing to mix because mm -hmm. we want the sauce to emulsify and get creamy. Right. If you dump it all in at once, it could break. So, so just be meantime, careful with that. Boiling your pasta. Yes. In the meantime, we've been boiling our pasta. We have taken a little bit of that pasta water to add to our sauce as we're cooking it up. Right. And I even took some of those corn cobs that we had oh, and yeah. popped them into the water. And what that's going to do is it's going to further infuse that mm. corn flavor That's into cool. the pasta itself. Okay. And then you're going to take the sauce and the pasta together? Exactly. So once that cheesy sauce has melted and mm. emulsified, we're going to add that pasta directly into it, give it a nice toss, add any more so uh, pasta water it. that we need, and we're garnishing with more cheese, that crispy bacon, and some fresh chives. Oh, it's so baby. good. This is and like... it's time to eat. All you know right. what I love about this? Because it's salty, but you have a sweetness without oh. like, mm -hmm. sugar right? or anything. You know? Fantastic. Oh, I'm and the so corn happy. made it creamier, like Elena without all Besser. the. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank wow. you. Very good. Wow.
it's an exciting day because we are launching a full Today Table cooking show with some of our favorite chefs all over on Today All Day. And we have one of them with us. Chef Elena Besser is with us. Good, Good morning. morning. Good morning, my friend. Congrats. Thanks. Yeah. I'm seriously so pumped about this series. I think everyone is going to love it. Such fun recipes. Mm -hmm. And it premieres and today. Yes. Yes. It's easy recipes. I love that. Well, it yes. smells so fresh in here. I mean, there's just so many herbs mm. that go into this recipe of yours. Yes, there are. Uh, herb quiz, quick quiz. Al, can you name all these herbs? Uh, dill, chive, uh, uh, mint, uh, basil, uh, parsley. Yes, you got them all. Okay. You got them Yay. all. Yay. Sometimes I have to 10. taste parsley to so yes, make sure it's not so long. I love so it. This is such a fun way to use all of those beautiful herbs that are in season, coming in season right now. I know our gardens are starting to bloom. And what we're going to do is we're going to create a really easy herb pesto okay. that has a lot of spinach in it as the foundation. So and we should mention people can shop along right now. If you yes. just scan that QR code, mm -hmm. you can get the menu. I don't know the verbiage for it. I don't have the verbiage. But you can get all the ingredients. It takes you right to Walmart and gets and the ingredients. Yeah, they can boom. ship yeah. them right to your house. Wow. So this is a really easy herbaceous sauce, and it's going to have some lemon herbaceous. zest and lemon juice in it. Mm, so what we're going to do you. is we're just going to take a lemon. This is a rasp grater, also known as a microplane, uh -huh. and you just zest. You have one that of those, right? That beautiful right. zest into <laughs> it at the restaurant that I cooked one. at. We would get in trouble if we sliced a lemon before zesting it it's because true. there's so much flavor mm. in the uh, zest of the lemon itself. Mm. Okay. So you want to stop can you at the way. Yeah, you can pre zest, but it just make sure. Though. Yeah, make sure you put it in your refrigerator in like an airtight okay. baggie okay. or you cover it up. Okay. okay. Then Smells what you're good. also going to do once you've zested them, you'll slice them in half, take a citrus press. Pop that in. Contrary to popular belief, you actually want to put it cut side down to mm -hmm. get the most juice out okay. of it. Mm -hmm. This has one garlic clove in it, too, so we will typically take all of these lemons, pop okay. them in there. So good. But for time, I want to make sure we get to all of the different <laughs> steps. Okay. Then you're going to take a ton of fresh spinach, okay. several handfuls. You want to have a really nice high speed blender or a mm -hmm. food processor. Take all of those herbs that we have over there. You oh, can use any variety in. that you want. Um, and the main thing here is you just want to go with soft herbs that are going to easily break down. Okay. You're also going to add in some olive oil, extra virgin olive oil for extra flavor mm -hmm. and we're gonna pop that in blend it on up and then you are left with this beautiful bright green Yay, sauce which yeah. is right over here so Could this you is what everyone can see arugula instead of the spinach yes, to, to pepper it up I mm. love that suggestion mm. you absolutely could use arugula you could use any green I love the nuttiness so the peppery taste this of is the such arugula. a good idea to get rid of those extra herbs right? in your garden because I did that last year I had all these herbs and I just had nothing sure. to do with them it's the best and or it's ones so that are easy kind of on their last leg yeah, yeah. Kind of throw in there. Absolutely. Freshen them up. So we have rigatoni right here. Okay. This is my favorite pasta shape. It catches all that saucy goodness. Mm -hmm. You're just going to take all that rigatoni, transfer it right into this big bowl of sauce. And what's fun is you can just serve it directly in this bowl. So oh, it's yeah. all going to come together right in I love this bowl. And the extra pasta goodness. water. Yes. The pasta water is yeah. key. We really want pasta water here. I call it unicorn sauce. I know that's ridiculous. <laughs> but the reason why is because it's magical, my friends. Okay. <laughs> This has all of that starchy goodness that's going mm -hmm. to really allow the it. sauce to stick to the pasta itself rather than running right off. Mm -hmm. So we are just going to continue mm -hmm. tossing this up. And a fun little thing that I like to do, other than adding a lot of cheese, because uh -huh. I'm from the Midwest and I can't help myself. <laughs> Wait, I need as from? much cheese. Chicago. Oh, that's right. We talked about Born that. and raised, and we're both wildcats. <laughs> yeah. But you know, are you throwing dates in there? Okay, oh, this God. is a dates. crazy twist. Oh, so I actually, I half of my family lives in Israel, so. I love eating dates. Oh my God. Love them. Love to integrate them into mm. anything. And a little bite of sweetness. These taste like concentrated maple syrup, if you will. <laughs> yes. So I like to add them to the oh top of whatever, uh, of this pasta oh, wow. specifically, Whoa. but also whatever I'm cooking. Girl. You like it? And then some toasted pine nuts because a little extra nuttiness. We're happy to have it. And oh. some extra fresh mm. herbs. And oh you know God. what? I'm so happy everyone likes it. What's oh great God. about this too is that if you have leftovers the next day, it is delicious cold. It tastes Can I like sing a, your praises? Mm. So you should go to today.com, watch her show, get this food, because sometimes when chefs are here and they cook, there's a little buzz in the studio about how good yeah. it was. With you this morning, everybody was buzzing mm -hmm. about how good this pasta is. Thank and this is another one. And you know what I love so about much. this? Sometimes I find with pesto, it gets monotonous, and I'm eating the pesto, and I'm like, ugh. This mm -hmm. is like... You get a lemony bite and then yeah. you get a nice crunchy Good. salt, but then the sweetness cleanses your palate and for another looks, salty pesto it just bite. Looks yes. Beautiful. So we say That's yes. My, oh, that was not planned. Such great descriptions. Exactly. I love all of you. It's such Thank a pleasure. You. By the way, if you, you like so dates, 
Rancho Metaluca. Okay. Makes a, it's, a ran, it's a date farm out in California. Spectacular. Really? Okay, I got it. TV host Elena Besser. She has not one, but two desserts two. that we can make ahead of time. So all you have to do is scan that QR code right at the bottom of the screen. You can cook along with us with one click, select get ingredients, and then you can schedule that pickup or Perfect. that delivery. Elena, good morning good to you. Good morning. That's good morning. Awesome. Good always morning. great to be with Pumpkin you. Pumpkin mini cheesecakes. You know it. Yum. It's always fun when you have an individual dessert portion and mini versions sure. of desserts just bring me so much joy. So we are changing up the traditional graham cracker crust and we are using ginger snaps to add that autumnal flair. So we have some okay. brown sugar. We've got our ginger snap cookies and we are going to pulse this on up in a food processor. Ooh, can I until, pulse? I love to yes, pulse. Yes, please do. Just okay. The, what do you the got the over there? What is that, butter? Yes, and we've got some melted butter. Feel free to get after that. And then, oh, once it is all night, keep on going. Yeah. Ooh. And once it is fully the consistency of sand, okay. you're going to stream in. Greg's really having a good time. You're doing great. You're oh, going to stream sorry. in that melted No, you're doing Keep going, Greg. Keep going. Stream in that melted butter. And it's going to end up looking like wet sand. Then you oh, push yeah. it into the little ram <laughs> Exactly. And you take a glass and press it down to create this little crust. Chanel, if you Honestly, want to try Honestly, I could out, just eat this by itself. I thought that was brown sugar. <laughs> it, it's a little brown sugar like brown plus sugar. ginger snacks. Oh, that's, yeah. that's good. Right, right? Uh, this is by itself. Right? right, so you do that. And so you do that. You pop that into the oven for about 10 minutes to set. And then we're going to start on our filling. So okay. we have cream cheese. We have brown sugar. We've got white sugar in here. And we are Other going... Side. Yeah, I keep doing that. I know, it's KitchenAid, Elena. What's it's a KitchenAid. Yeah, I love KitchenAid. They're the best. <laughs> um, and we're going to whip this on up. Then we're adding in all of our other flavorings. So we've Great. got the cinnamon. Eggs going That's a warm we got flavor. our eggs. That's a warm flavor. We have, oh, ooh, one wow. hand. Hey. Okay. One more. Let's go. Okay. Yeah. Hey. Look one at this more. executive chef right there. There we go. Hey. Oh, man. Oh, in my man. kitchen at home. Look at that. Skills. I love it. And then we're adding a she little bit like of kosher salt. <laughs> exactly. We're adding in some vanilla extract. And this wouldn't be a pumpkin cheesecake unless we had our pumpkin puree. So you True. could also swap out sweet potato if you want. You pop that in here. You end up having this delicious mixture. Yum. Wait, where do you get that? Is that in a can? Yeah, you can get it in a can. Okay. Let's save the time, you know. Okay. I know, I know. <laughs> and then we are pouring it into all of our ramekins. It's a nice 
thick, delicious batter. Sam, who doesn't love a good ramekin? No. Well, Pop that in, and then we are going to sure. bake it in the oven. And this is the fun, is really awesome. chefy mm. moment here. Okay. And this is what's going to give us that luxurious, creamy texture. We are going to add in water wow. to the bottom. This creates a water bath. So what happens is, instead of that cheesecake cooking too quickly, it's going to slowly poach it, so you get that really delicious, ah. creamy texture. I gotta get your food. And, but wait, there's more. There's wait, more. there's we more. Also, We're gonna start eating. Have it. Some so please start eating it. We have some brown sugar oh and gosh. butter. We've got pumpkin seeds. We have mm. pecans oh or God. pecans, Ooh. however you All say it. it. And oh a little gosh. bit of salt. Mix it up. We're making Girl. a brittle. Oh my, we that's have really this that's brittle, ridiculous. And we're topping it with oh. um, some whipped cream that is sweetened with maple syrup. I wasn't expecting this. The fall flavor. It's Isn't so this soft. Fun? Yeah, Here's it's a thing. pump. It's Each like a layer is yummy on its own. Like oh, even yeah. that right there is yummy. Oh, like, I'm so. And it's fun to just snack on the brittle because it comes in I mean. these nice. Wait, we didn't talk about the crumble. Oh, we have to talk about the crumble. Okay. Okay. So crumble is such an easy dessert that you can make really far in advance. You can make all of these in advance, by the way. Mm. This you can store in the fridge for up Gosh. to a week, unmold and serve it. And then with the crumble, you could make this oh, and freeze more. it, wrap it on up. This is cranberry and apple crumble. Uh, oh you bake gosh. it in the oven, let it cool completely, wrap it up, put it in your freezer, and then right before mm. you're serving, pop it into the oven at 350 degrees. You're going to put tin foil over it, pour some melted butter over it oh to God. reheat it, Whoa. and then serve it a la mode because always ice cream. Mm. Is there some lemon something in here? What's there's some on? lemon, there's a little orange. If orange isn't your thing, you can just omit the orange. Um, oh, this is but great. I'm happy you guys like it. Crumble's so easy. It's so delicious. It's a crowd pleaser. And what I love about it, not very many dishes. You yeah, make it in the iron. Yeah. You pop it on the table. Oh it looks stunning. And your whole family is going to love it. Cheers to you. I like them both. To you. I know they're both really yummy. What are you doing for Thanksgiving? I am going to be in Florida with my family. It'll be fun. It's the first year I'm not cooking in a while. I was going to say, you? You, you deserve to. I was just about <laughs> to invite you to, to my, uh, my in-laws. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> So what are we making this morning? We are oh. making a spiced apple loaf cake. We are celebrating the bounty of the season with these gorgeous apples. You can use Honeycrisp, you could use Granny Smith, whatever your favorite apple is. And we're gonna start by peeling it up and giving it a nice grate on a box grater. Okay. I figured it would be easier to grate it instead of taking all that time to chop. We're doing a lot of chopping yeah. already. That's a nice yeah, tip. So let's, let's make it easy. Watch your fingers. Yeah, be Thank careful. You. Wouldn't that be terrible? Please. Yeah. Yeah. Craig no. Safety <laughs> only. Safety <laughs> only. <laughs> Um, and then the next thing we're going to do is we're taking a bowl of sugar and some oil, uh, adding two room temperature eggs, a little bit of Greek yogurt for some. Oh, that's where you get that little tank. You could also use sour cream if you prefer, and then a nice healthy amount of vanilla extract. Mm. In baked goods, vanilla extract kind of acts like the salt. It brings out all of the flavors mm. in the baked good. Uh, so if you want to keep yes, mixing that up. And I notice we keep the wet and dry separate here. Absolutely. We want to keep the wet and dry separate. It's really important to just 
just make sure we're mixing the wet together before the dry so that we have a nice even baked good that is really fluffy and delicious. Ladies, awesome Sobo, how are you? Yeah, I love it. Delightful. Yummy. Really oh, good. Okay. Delightful. Good. And then we're going to add in some warming spices. We have cinnamon, ginger, nutmeg, our flour, all of our rising agents Warming in here. spices. Mm. I didn't, I've never heard them referred nice to as that. Nice and cozy. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take those apples. We're going to add them to the wet ingredients. Okay. And then we're going to mix that all in with the dry ingredients. And it goes into our grease loaf pan. And if you want, you could actually add a little olive oil in there. The fruitiness oh, from the olive oil okay. is really going to add a lovely So this flavor. goes into this. So this goes into this, goes into our pan. We bake it until it a uh, toothpick inserted in the center comes out nice and clean. Mm -hmm. And now we're making the frosting. It's and this time the frosting the is frosting. yummy. Real good. Best so part. what we're going to do is we're going to cream together butter and butter. Uh, cream cheese. Butter. And we all the butter. Yeah. That's what this holiday is all about. Yeah. There's yeah. even more butter in a second. So get ready. <laughs> so we're going to cream all of this together. And then we slowly, it's not turning out. It, it, yes, it is. It's going to turn it, Oh, there we go. Look I was looking that. at the wrong side. <laughs> and we're just going to cream that together until it's nice and whipped. We are adding in cinnamon. One of, one of the warm spices. Yes. Yeah. A warm spice. Feeling warm. You're yeah. learning. You're learning. I love it. Some vanilla extract as well. A warm extract. That's yeah. a warm extract. <laughs> a pinch of salt to additionally awaken all of the flavor. And then we're slowly but surely, do you want to add it in? Sure. Adding in that uh, powdered sugar. And this is going to make sure it adds a subtle amount of sweetness, but we don't want too much. Yeah. I, I don't like when a, a frosting is too overpowering yeah, yeah, and yeah. cloyingly sweet. So we're adding a little bit in. And then a touch of milk to smooth it on out. Okay. And once that is done and whipped to perfection, we're heading on over to our stovetop. This is a fun little extra thing that I think. This, this is unexpected. It's fun, right? Yeah. So we're melting oh. a little bit of butter on our on a skillet. Okay. Mm. And once we've sliced up our bread, uh, you take it. Next level. And you toast it on up <laughs> so it gets nice and yeah. toasty. Yeah. It tasted toasty, Elena. Did you, spr did you sprinkle a little salt on top of that frosting? You know I did. It tastes so good. It really nailed it. Yes, that thank frosting you. Is Spot yeah. on. It's not too heavy either. Oh, mm -hmm. I'm happy to hear that. I and like this that. is a fun dessert that you can serve after the meal. You can also serve it in the morning. I was going to so say, it's yeah. breakfast. If you want to do a make ahead, then how do you, like, you make it and then you put it freeze in the it? freezer or the fridge? How yes, long will it you keep? can wrap it in plastic wrap, yeah. then wrap it in foil because we want to make sure no air gets inside of it. We don't want any freezer burn. Yeah. Pop it into the freezer the night before serving, put it into your refrigerator. It will thaw. And then you can slice it up, mm -hmm. griddle it if you want, griddle or you can it. just have it as is. Yes, yes. But that nice. Nice. Yeah, have it for breakfast, have it for lunch, have nice. it as a snack, have it after dinner. <laughs> Enjoy have it, it. Have have it. it. season so good. long. Yeah. I'm gonna thank you. Have it while you're meditating on that thing. Oh, oh, I God. still wish we had it. Oh, we would love that. <laughs> Cannot go wrong with dips. I love dips. I'm a dip head from the old country. Here to show us a few of her favorites is Chef Elena Besser. Hello. So nice to meet you. Oh, it is oh. so great to meet We're you. We're so happy that you're here. Okay, everyone loves that everything bagel seasoning. Oh, addicted. Yeah. Obsessed. Addicted. Okay, so I didn't think about it in a dip, but you say, yes, you can. You can absolutely dip it out, you know? Okay. All about the dips. My dad is, um, I say he's part bagel because yeah. he eats a bagel literally every yeah, day. No, so I this I was is, half Jewish. This, I was like, yeah, oh. Also that. And, um, I, and, and this is it. an homage <laughs> to him. And um, so all you have to do, you can buy some gorgeous everything bagel spice at the store. Okay. You can add that on in. To what? I like adding a lot into the cream cheese. That's oh, an important cream. component. This is softened cream cheese right okay. here. We also have some sour cream. So what I oh. like to do is just add that on in. Right? It I love sour nice cream. I, I love French onion dip. Do, Do you, you love from the packet? Oh. The oh, onion with dip the, packet? Yes. Lift it. You just dump it in. Oh, I can rub it on my gums Fritos. sometimes I with the packet. It's, it's so, so nice. Weird. I'm a strange person. I have it growing up. It's the way it's the way <laughs> Okay, but, right, okay. So, so we zest. added lemon juice and zest, and okay. we're just going to continue to mix this on up. Okay. And do you want to help me out? Let's pour in some capers. Let's okay, add some. Mm -hmm. How many? The capers are strong. No, you're kidding. I'm serious. All right. I'm fully serious here. Big caper fan. And you just just mix it all some up. Some spring onions. Some spring onions. Let's do it. Absolutely. Great. This adds a nice little crunch. It's like all the things that you love in a bagel in dip form. Oh which my is gosh. The best. I could eat this with a spoon, actually. I'm not joking. Would like yogurt. you like to? I actually want to try it. Okay, here. Let's here, try, here, it. Here, here, try here, it with the here, spatula. Okay. Thank you very much. Just right Look, there. I'm well, we have the pretty ones right here, but you add a little no, um, extra look, you can scallion on in. top, right? Can I like, tell you something? This, this is, so, is so yummy. Mm -hmm. And you can have tomatoes or cucumbers, whatever yes. you want. Any crudite you want, mm. feel free to leave it out. And it doesn't, you don't just have to have a bagel for breakfast. You can have it whenever you want. With I love it. I love that. Flavor is yummy. Seasoning, I can put in anything, mm. the everything bagel. Mm.